Call to order the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of March 27, 2019. This is the meeting that was to take place on March 13th, but that was canceled due to the uh, bomb cyclone weather. And <laughs> for those of you who are watching us remotely while out on spring break, please know that <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful here. <laughs> <laughs> so our first order of business is to wish farewell to Kevin Bracey Knight for his uh, five years of service on the Open Space Board. Um, which followed five years of service on the county's uh, Parks and Open Space Advisory Committee. And I'm uh, going to read the uh, fairly lengthy proclamation to um, honor the occasion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, with that, a proclamation recognizing the dedication and volunteer service of Kevin Bracey Knight to Open Space and Mountain Parks 2014 to 2019. Whereas Kevin Bracey Knight has been a member of the Open Space Board of Trustees for the past five years. <clears throat> Whereas Kevin Bracey Knight has shown a strong passion and commitment for open space and mountain parks, applying his many fields of specialized scientific knowledge and supportive decisions that guide OSMP policymaking. Kevin has devoted countless hours meeting with community members, staff, elected and appointed officials to listen to perspectives <coughs> and information that had bearing on policy decisions at times into late night and early morning hours. Kevin can be counted on to thoroughly read and analyze materials shared with the Open Space Board of Trustees and often through his own inquiries on subjects, offer additional perspectives and insights that enrich the thoroughness of topics under discussion. His numerous contributions include the following. <clears throat> During Kevin's tenure, the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department has acquired nearly 1,450 acres of land, including Boulder Valley Farm, Martinson, Delia Ranch, Coleman Oliver, Suits Trust, Lippincott, Fort Chambers, Poor Farm, Ryan Two, and a trail easement area over the North, Hills, what, North Foothills Business Park. Through Kevin's five-year term, there have been many raptor fledgings, including six bald eagles, 15 golden eagles, 57 osprey, 33 peregrine falcons, 19 prairie falcons, 80 burrowing owl, and eight northern harrier. Over the last five years, the Open Space Board of Trustees and Open Space and Mountain Parks have increased their investment in system stewardship, including trail stewardship projects, which Kevin frequently championed, largely completed all trail repairs related to the 2013 flood, crafted the North Trail Study Area Plan and the Agricultural Resources Management Plan and recommended changes and guiding principles in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan update. Kevin helped guide the first master plan for the department through several key stages and positioned it well for successful completion and Kevin has shown great support and enthusiasm for data-informed management, supporting staff efforts to invest in data collection and analysis, reflecting on research and findings shared with the OSBT, enhancing his understanding through thoughtful questioning, providing guidance based on information, and promoting making information accessible to the public. His supportive stewardship principles, research, respectful and productive community engagement has provided staff with a sense of confidence and built great trust between the OSBT and the department. Now therefore, I, Tom Isaacson, it, it's in bold, um, <laughs> uh, Chair of the Open Space Board of Trustees, do hereby proclaim that the leadership exhibited by Kevin Bracey Knight over these past five years has been instrumental to the success of this board and the Open Space Program, proclaim this 27th day of March in the year 2019 on behalf of the Open Space Board of Trustees and the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, if I could add a little bit of personal comment. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, before, before you, I just got to say that hatching all of those raptors really hard work. My bug got really tired work. sitting on top of all those eggs. I haven't had a full head of hair when you joined this board. <laughs> that actually is true. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a second to express my gratitude for having been able to serve on the board with you for two years. Uh, Although I've been friends with Kevin for 15 years, you know, we've shared periods of outdoor adventure together and we've gone through periods where time, where life has taken us in really different directions. But I've always been impressed with your, your deep intellect, your drive to learn new things, even in a phase in life where normal people want to give their brains a break. Um, like 
your kindness and patience in trying circumstances, your commitment to cause, your ability to speak passionately and clearly in defense of principles you hold dear, and your knack for decomposing technical material into metaphors that people can understand with their hearts and minds. So, of course, you brought all these skills to your time on OSBT, and, and I'm just grateful to be here serving with you. Um, I'm really hopeful that, uh, where's that part? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I've also seen how much you appreciate and have a deep love for all things Boulder. And so I'm just really hopeful that you'll continue to work hard for a vibrant future for this city. Thanks. That's really nice. And uh, Kurt wanted to make sure um, that I added that he um, wants to thank you for always reminding us of the value of the raw data and the importance of sharing it with the public. I think that is um, that mm -hmm. does capture a lot of the sort of specialized scientific knowledge and way of thinking that you brought to this board. And uh, personally, the thing that struck me more than anything was that you almost without exception brought interesting perspectives that reflected, you know, clearly your own your experience, your knowledge, your perspective, your values, mm -hmm. that you didn't fall into sort of easy ways of thinking about problems, that you brought a point of view that I think we all benefited very much from hearing and a point of view that often, you know, we probably wouldn't have heard if you hadn't been around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Can I just say as well, I know Dan is off enjoying spring break, but I know he'd like to be here and just personally say his gratitude and thanks for the service you've provided. And I think uh, I'll just also state you know, one of the things we deal with a lot of important and serious issues that we have to wrestle with, but you also, one of the qualities you typically bring in is a moment of laughter, too, and I think that's <laughs> really important. And you can see that Mark and I carefully figured out what we would wear tonight to make sure it didn't have any reflection on Star Trek, okay? Because we, we did not want to be the, the lens of that, so. But seriously. Really good last <laughs> <laughs> but we really do seriously appreciate kind of the time you've taken, the level of effort you've put in, and I think as well said by your peers, you know, the, the great thought that you've contributed to our processes over the last five years. So thank you. Thank you. So you have your your gift and the signed proclamation. It's like it's like when you leave the prices, right? You know, it's like <laughs> a parting gift and you know. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right, then uh, next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. I know Karen has already conveyed six uh, small typographical changes, which Leah has uh, adopted. Is there anything else that anyone has? Nope. nope. All right, do we have a motion to approve? I move we approve the minutes as, a, as revised or as amended or whatever the right word is. I'll second them. <laughs> okay. All in favor? All right. All right, so the uh, next item is public comment for items not identified for public hearing. The one item for public hearing tonight is the disposal. So anyone who wishes to speak on any other topic, that's the time, this is the time to do so. We have, it looks like nine, ten, ten people signed up. So uh, three minutes each and I think someone is uh, pooling, so five minutes for the um, pooling. So, um, as follow the usual, I'll call people up and, you know, please be ready to go so we can move um, fairly expeditiously from person to person. Uh, the first is Ina Robbins, followed by Samagra Melville, and then Molly Davis. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ina Robbins, and I have spoken to you before on behalf of Friends of Wonderland Lake. Again, we thank you for your responsiveness to the concerns that have been raised about infrastructure at the lake by taking a pier and boardwalk off the table and initiating a more thorough assessment of community needs and desires for the lake area. As stewards of this wildlife sanctuary, we continue to have concerns about the potential for building structures in and around the lake, as well as the dubious narrative that in order to provide youth nature education, infrastructure like a waiting area would be necessary. The, set, the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics is based right here in Boulder. They are a treasure trove of resources for youth education without detriment to habitat. 
We understand that OSMP is facing a 30% shortfall in funding. We suggest that not building structures at Wonderland Lake would be an excellent way to conserve funds and conserve the lake area. What is needed at the lake is maintenance and improvement of existing trails and fences, signage to inform visitors about proper conduct to protect and respect the habitat, and regular patrolling to enforce existing regulations. We also request that the original signage describing Wonderland Lake as a wildlife sanctuary, which prohibits boating, wading, and swimming, be reinstalled at entry points to the lake as well as on the peninsula. City Councilwoman Lisa Morzell also asked that this sign be restored at the February 19th City Council meeting. Finally, our group has submitted a request and petition with over 600 signatures to the City of Boulder for a commemorative name change that would title the lake as Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary. Without changing the legal status of the lake area, we hope this name change would convey to visitors that this area is to be treated with the reverence a sanctuary deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Uh, Samagra Melville and then Molly Davis. <coughs> I also want to thank you for hearing the concerns of the community regarding the proposed changes <coughs> at Wonderland Lake. And basically for everything you do, I think it's holy work you do. Um, on January 15th, during the meeting at North Boulder Rec Center, one of the questions you received was about the signage developed by Open Space naming Wonderland Lake a wildlife sanctuary. This was in part the OSMP response. In the late 1980s, the Open Space Department identified the need to reduce the effects of undesignated user-created trails and other off-trail use along the shorelines of Wonderland Lake. This word sanctuary was used to communicate the function, importance, and value of the area, especially the lake and shoreline, as wildlife habitat. The combination of education, ranger patrol, and infrastructure were supported by the community and evidence of undesignated trails decreased and are no longer evident today. It was a brilliant system. <laughs> the split rail fences blend beautifully with the surroundings. <coughs> Wait. Oh. <laughs> the signs asking people to leave the fragile shorelines undisturbed with the graphic of a heron in the marsh are lovely. The message was light-handed but the message was received. Unfortunately, I'm here to report that your very brilliant system is unraveling. Here are a few uh, pictures of the conditions around the trail at Wonderland Lake today. That picture is not upside down, the sign is. I'm here to report that just a few months without signs naming Wonderland Lake a wildlife sanctuary, along with a year so a fence is being neglected to the point of dereliction. And the message being communicated at Wonderland Lake now is, here's the line, but whatever. I could show more. Uh, here's our valiant Canada geese huddled together on a morning where temperature started at minus seven. Two weeks ago, I noticed that after going through the long cold winter, they were making those especially squawky sounds that mean it's time to leave the huddle and pair off in their favorite nesting sites on the shoreline. On that day, there were literally hundreds of waterfowl in the lake. Then I watched a couple of young men launch a large remote control motorboat from the peninsula. They drove their boat right into the flocks of waterfowl for the fun of watching them take flight. The day after that incident, there were almost no wild birds in the lake. They are very gradually returning now, and within the next few weeks, wildlife of all kinds will be staking out their nesting territory in Wonderland shoreline. As the fences have <coughs> degraded, there's been an increase in off-trail use along the shorelines of Wonderland Lake. This is an area on the south shore of the lake, which is a major wildlife corridor, and this couple were just returning from an off-trail exploration to this shoreline Mm, please have the fences repaired and replace the signage to allow visitors to understand the importance of this sanctuary again. Thank you, Samagra. Uh, Molly Davis, followed by Judy Snook, and then Mark Fitch. <coughs> Hi, guys. 
Molly Davis, five, six, three, five, Corey Corn. Kevin, thank you for your service. I know how much work it was, and I agree. There were a lot of times that Kevin brought up things that I didn't even consider, and it was great. Um, I'm coming to, do, to talk to you about the condition of the agricultural lands. Tonight, I'm just gonna focus on Boulder Valley Ranch, um, its condition. Um, uh, Boulder Valley Ranch, let me, I went back, um, makes their living a very, many ways, cattle, horse boarding, haying. And we made it kind of difficult for them because of the prairie dog infestation on the ranch. In a perfect commodity market, um, cows would fetch this kind of money at the end, 81,000 um, in the market that it is right now. And because Bob Lover didn't have enough grazing land, he had to get rid of 50 cows. The loss to him was $36,000. When you sell cows <coughs> prematurely, you also lose the calves, but you, you lose the bloodlines. So the income loss keeps going. This was the conditions of the ranch where he boards horses. And horses out at the ranch are for boarding, but he also uses the horses for working. Um, this is now the condition that that same um, area is because of the prairie dogs. That pasture will be gone by this fall. Um, we're now starting to pup with the prairie dogs, so it's gonna start to even look worse. I sent my nonprofit out and sent people to photograph all the conditions on the ranch, so we'll be bringing you pictures progressively about that. And I um, asked someone to come tonight to talk about large equine damage to animals when they step into holes. So if a horse steps into a hole like this, it most likely would break its leg. Um, I don't think we moved quick enough. We've done the prairie dog working, <coughs> but we really have not made a significant move to do something about this problem. We should ask ourselves during the master plan, is this the stewardship model that we want? This is Bob Lover standing in front of one of the mounds. The mounds get much larger on irrigated grounds because it makes it much easier for the dogs to dig. <coughs> in the way that we write our leases, we limit our legacy farmers and farmers to have an AUMs, how many animals they're allowed to have on a unit. If we came out with a lease and we saw these kind of conditions, we wouldn't write a lease for them. So I thought I'd put a few things that really get home. This is 36, and this is where you see a lot of bicyclists riding. These are huge holes on the land right on the side of the road. And here's the leases. Um, you'll notice that Boulder Valley Ranch leases 1,512 acres. The occupation of prairie dogs is at 55%, half of his ranch, although he still pays for the lease, is covered by prairie dogs. So I'd like to point out at the bottom, the blip property, we paid a million six, 60 for that, and it's useless now. This field was used once for hay, it's 86 acres, I went out, you can't take any equipment on that. This is part B, this is part of the irrigated lands and this is where the pasture is. We have senior water rights. So the thing that that means to me is we're running our water, we're irrigating prairie dog holes. Um, Bob Lover told me that one of the holes to, fit, to chase the dogs out in the spring because we can't do anything else. Um, when he did that, 
he, um, I'm running out of time here, he had about an hour and a half to fill the hole up with water, which we figure is probably about 200 gallons. I'm gonna send this presentation to you so you can see it. Just got it done about 15 minutes ago. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, Judy Snook, then Mark Fitch and Raymond Bridge. Good evening. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Judy Snook, a longtime Boulder resident. I just retired from a job in child abuse, having served about almost 52 years, which brings me to the fact that I have boarded out at Boulder Valley Ranch for 50 years. And that's long before it became Boulder Valley. It used to be Green Valley and it used to be a dude ranch. I have been through many leasees or managers, if you want to call them that. And I think Bob Lover is the best one who has maintained the land properly. But it's very difficult, again, as you heard about the prairie dog holes. I have a horse out there. I think he recently, you know, stepped in a hole and luckily, hopefully, didn't break his leg, but he's doing better now. But it's devastating. I've watched over the years, you know, I've watched <coughs> the prairie dogs. I've been there long enough to know that there's been a cycle. I think somehow we've messed the balance of nature and we have tripled the number of prairie dogs that are out there. It's amazing that they're on the roads, they're on the trails, a biker could get hurt if they hit one, a human being can get hurt. I think it's important to maintain our land and not think of buying more. We need to maintain what we have. We have a diversity out at the ranch. We have a Hispanic population and look at the diversity in terms of recreational use we have cows, we have horses, we have bikers, we have dogs. Uh, it, it's amazing, it's a working ranch. And how valuable is that? But we need to be stewards of our land, you know, and take care of it. Bob knows how to do that, but he can't do it with all the holes and the prairie dogs. <coughs> Pretty soon they'll be up in the parking lot, you know, and it's, it's gonna be gone. I think it's very sad that we spend a lot of money purchasing something and are not maintaining it. And that's just the prairie dogs. We need to maintain the rest of the ranch, you know, the structures, et cetera. Uh, I think this is extremely valuable for our future, for our future generations to experience the agriculture life. And that's what they do. I clean the, believe it or not, an auction. I clean the paddocks, do the mucking out there. And often we'll watch as families are, you know, waving at the horses and the cows, et cetera. It's just kind of like, Wow, they enjoy that. This is a piece of nature that they can have. Please, please work on taking care of this problem and preserving this valuable piece of property. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Mark Fitch. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Fitch and uh, I'm a veterinarian. I've uh, been uh, in practice for 43 years. 42 of those has been in Boulder, Longmont area. And uh, uh, tonight I wanna comment on the uh, effects that the prairie dogs have on the horses. So when those horses step in a hole, especially if, if they run, and um, the first line of defense for a horse, if he doesn't feel safe in his environment, is to run. If they're distracted and are not paying attention to where the holes are and step in that holes, then they, they will break a leg, and we have seen that in our practice. And when they break a leg, they break it into multiple pieces, eight to 10 pieces, and it's compounded, meaning it goes through the skin, and there is no chance that that horse could ever recover. So if a person would happen to be riding their horse in that, then the risk is also of uh, injury to the human, especially a head injury. Uh, I know the leases of, uh, or the leasers of both Boulder Valley Ranch and Boulder Valley Farm, and neither of those people will ride their horse together or cattle off at those pastures that are full of prairie dog holes for because of the risk of a horse stepping in there and, and hurting the horse and also hurting themselves. Uh, the pattern that I've seen in, in lots of, of different environments, I grew up in Wyoming. I know of a ranch up there that didn't do anything to control the prairie dogs. It was a privately owned ranch that had been in a family for a century. Um, it was 
the, the landowner at the time decided not to try to regulate the number of prairie dogs, completely ruined that ranch to 25,000 acres, and he packed his stuff up and walked away. Uh, so without some sort of supervision, there's always a balance, and, is, and the balance now is out of control. Uh, so it's coming uh, <coughs> if you don't do something about it, and I know it's some hard decisions, but uh, get as much information as you can, but the pattern is always the same. The prairie dogs move in, the mounds prevent adequate uh, irrigation, the prairie dogs overgraze the grass, <coughs> no water, uh, now it's bare land, now the weeds move in, all the noxious weeds, thistle, bindweed, uh, Russian knapweed, um, and then from then you have no pro productivity and then you're gonna have a hard time finding people that wanna lease that land because they can't grow anything on it. That's the pattern and it goes over and over every time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And, and I should note on this subject, sorry Ray, I have to take one second, okay. that we do have the prairie dogs issue on our agenda for the meeting in two weeks, so exactly two weeks from today, we have uh, that issue. We also have, there's two tours um, that are being set up so members of the board, members of city council and others can tour uh, properties that are particularly impacted by prairie dogs. One is on April 2nd, one is on April 17th. We may discuss those a bit later, but I did want to at least assure you that this has not um, fallen off of our radar screen at all. It's you know very much front and center. Sorry, I'm sorry, Ray. That's okay. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Raymond Bridge, 435 South 38th Street in Boulder, and I'm speaking on behalf of the 1,600 members of the Boulder County Audubon Society. I'm, in considering the guiding principles of the master plan, we suggest that you should look to the system overview, specifically Table <coughs> 3.1, which lays out departmental goals and objectives to fulfill its charter purposes. It states, where there are real or potential conflicts between nature and human use in the Boulder Mountain Parks, preference will be given to sustaining nature, both for its intrinsic values and its value as a component of human experience. We believe that this clear statement should be added to the guiding principles. One of your other topics this evening, the recommendations of the Prairie Dog Working Group we urge that you strongly advocate continuing to follow the grassland ecosystem management plan. I'm not talking about agricultural properties now. The ecosystem management plan was adopted by this board in 2009 and city council in 2010. We need to continue to manage OSMP properties for ecosystems and it is folly to assume that our grasslands can absorb all the prairie dogs displaced by development elsewhere in the city and county of land that was once prairie dog habitat for other human uses. Assuaging guilt that citizens feel for displacing prairie dogs should not guide policy. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Paula Schuler, followed by David, um, I think it's Shaldock, and then Mike Barrow and Andre Hausney. Hi, Paula Schuler, 4560 Niwot Road. My husband and I live and farm on private property in North Boulder County. We are sustainable agriculture. This 160 acre farm has been in the same family for over a century, and we plan to continue for generations to come. But the city of Boulder is making this very difficult. Our land, our livestock, and our livelihood are being negatively affected by prairie dogs migrating from one place. Stratton and Brubaker, city-owned irrigated ag parcels. We have a huge conflict. It's expensive, time-consuming, and discouraging to battle prairie dogs coming from open space. It is so wrong that we have to defend our property from prairie dogs because we have a horrible neighbor, the city of Boulder. The city of Boulder values prairie dogs above agricultural land. You have a prairie dog working group, but who do you have to defend the ag land, pro you know, to defend ag lands. You don't have anyone. You're supposed to, as trustees in open space, you guys are supposed to be doing that. The city is only concerned with protecting the prairie dog, but at what cost? Recommendations, decisions, and policies are being made that are destroying property and livelihoods. You need to change that. Why aren't you concerned about protecting the ag lands from prairie dogs? 
Where's the balance? The city has come into our neighborhood and has allowed the prairie dogs to destroy irrigated ag parcels. This is against your land objectives and it's certainly against ours. Prairie dogs do not belong on irrigated ag land. Open Space paid $3.2 million for Stratton in 2007 and in 10 years has succeeded in ruining it because prairie dogs go unmanaged and have completely taken over. Those parcels have been irrigated since the late 1860s when the Crocker and the Johnson were made ditches and now they're almost unirrigatable. Irrigatable, irrigatable. Um, the vegetation is gone and the topsoil and the organics are blowing in the wind. Brubaker is almost worse. These are just two parcels. Prairie dogs are decimating over a thousand acres of city-owned irrigated ag parcels, your irreplaceable assets through Boulder County and nothing is being done. No management, zero stewardship. You're supposed to be preserving agriculture, <coughs> not destroying it. Boulder claims to be excellent land managers and wonderful stewards. I know and live a very different reality. You need to value and protect irrigated ag lands, yours and ours. Relocation as a management tool is not working. The city of Boulder needs to use lethal control when appropriate. And if you want sustainable agriculture as you profess, lethal control is appropriate. Our land, our legacy, our future. That's the tagline from your master plan, but those words certainly apply to our land as well. The city of Boulder needs to protect and actively manage their ag lands against prairie dogs and they need to be a better neighbor. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I also have a PowerPoint I'm gonna send you. It has a lot of images. Okay. I'll email it to you guys. Thank you, we'll, we'll read it. Um, David, is it Shawl Doc? Okay, uh, then Mike Barrow. Mike Barrow, 1103 Alexandria in Lafayette. Uh, I'm here to uh, say kudos to Kevin and thank him as well. Uh, but I'm also wanna address the board because I've been coming to these meetings since the 1990s. And I've seen a lot of dysfunction behind that dais over the years. But I gotta say that this board and the board that Molly was on as well, have been some of the most productive and civil and best data-driven groups of people that I've ever witnessed on this board. And I know all too well how hard this job is. And uh, I can't thank you enough for your service. And. Kevin, I know, you know they rattled off a whole bunch of uh, things that you were able to push through, but they didn't mention the one thing that I think was the most amazing thing that you did in your tenure here, and that was to uh, sneak in at a very late hour into the OSMP budget an entire trail crew to be added to the budget for the following year. And that has made a difference on our trails and uh, you know it, it, it hasn't really gotten the backlog going in the right direction but uh, that was the first real thing that I saw from OSMP that things were starting to turn around and I'm really pleased about that. By the way, I think Star Trek red uniforms would be real good, don't you? you know? <laughs> Ancillary carrier curve. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, the only other comment I'd like to make it has to do with the comments that you've already received this evening, and, and it's about the condition of Boulder Valley Ranch. We have a north uh, trail study area completion, and we know what we generally plan to do, but we aren't gonna wrap our arms around that for, what, three to five years, Steve? Yeah. Um, one of the things that probably pains Kevin the most about his tenure here is the push that he's made from the board to staff. You guys deal with whatever's on your agenda, but you rarely put something on the agenda to make happen and 
I'll just put it out there. I think maybe you ought to consider that kind of a, of, of a flow. Instead of all the stuff coming from staff, bring something forward that you want to champion. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. And last, uh, Andre Hausney. Hey, good evening. I'm back again. I'm Andre Husney from Jacob Springs Farm at 75th and Arapahoe, and I wanted to give you an update about this season's Boulder OSMP Ag leasing situation. Um, as you know, uh, John Potter did some excellent work in regard to transparency, and so uh, we actually have scoring now for uh, for the the bids that that were offered this year and how how they were scored and awarded. And so I want to review that with you, and, and unfortunately, it reveals that, that the problems are, are still there. Uh, so, you know, as you know, I, I've been a farmer, uh, now I have 26 years experience in farming, 16 years full-time, grew up here in Boulder, grew up hearing all these wonderful visions about how Boulder has an opportunity to use our public land to kickstart a local food system, to kickstart regenerative agriculture. We were told for years and years and years, this older generation of farmers, they're moving on and it's just a matter of time, hang in there, do the right thing, do, do your best, and you'll be able to access Boulder Ag Land and that's unfortunately not, not happening. And uh, so the, the new waiting system is, is there in place and my criticism of the waiting system beforehand, uh, before the, the, the results were, I, I sent, you, sent you an email, I just wanna read a couple things. With the advantage of 70% of the points Experienced current operators are preferred so strongly that a conventional operator with 10 years of experience running a simple hay operation with no element of local food <coughs> could beat out a newer sustainable farmer with, with nine years of, of, of experience and a diverse operation, even if they both had all the needed equipment and the finances to be successful. That's just not what we want. That's just not good enough. So as we look at the, the, uh, the results from this year's, there were six bidders that bid on, okay, back up, there were six properties that were offered or that were announced that would be offered back in January of 2018, and in the event, none of those were offered. They were all assigned to current lessees without going through a bidding process or to their uh, successors, let's say, and then a, a different two were offered. Only one of those is really suitable for uh, livestock operations like mine. And by the way, it's really hard to farm without land. It's really, really hard. And there's very few big parcels that are in private hands because of the aggressive and wonderful acquisition strategy of the city and the county. And so there's very little parcels. So you're the only game in town. And uh, so what's happened now is on this property, the King Hodgson property, there were six uh, bidders. Three of them I would categorize as conventional old style uh, operators with big operations with thousands of acres of public land and to whom a additional field will make very little difference. And there were three of us that were regenerative, local, sustainable, uh, local food focused with, with, for whom one field will make a huge difference. And it was scored just as predicted. The top three were the conventional, the bottom three the regenerative. Our farm was the fourth scoring bid, but there were some big problems in the consistency of how these things were done. Even on the fit, so as you know, we spent a lot of money reaching out to the city population, asking them, what do you want to have happen on your land? And I guarantee none of them said, you know what, let's have conventional agriculture, large scale, abuse the land, have very low, little local food or none that comes out of it. That's not what the ag resource plan is. And yet the conventional operations, two out of three, got a higher fit score than we did or than, in, than uh, the other two um, regenerative type operations. Something's wrong with the way these things are being scored and I'd really like you to look into it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre. And then last is L. Cushman. <clears throat> Hi, good evening, I'm L. Cushman. I live in 13450 North 75th Street, Longmont, Colorado. And I was a member of the Prairie Dog Working Group and I had been hesitant to speak because I didn't want to have a overlap of that until the working group presented. But tonight I am gonna speak, I told the working group when I signed on, which it was an honor to be in, that I had many different lenses. And one is a rancher's wife of a fifth generation homestead 
ranching family here in Boulder County, and the other is a Boulder hippie girl. And um, those are the two perspectives I'm gonna speak to from tonight. Um, when the, this establishment of this territory was a US government project, they sent, Abel Cushman was a Union soldier, and he was sent here to appropriate water rights, um, establish provable farmsteads, build schools, and um, establish territory in order to qualify for statehood. And the, um, those ditches and hay fields have been irrigated and harvested by this family for the last 160 years. This is, these families are <laughs> comprised of the oldest family owned and operated businesses in Colorado. It wasn't even Colorado when they started them. And the riparian areas, like we have so many amazing birds. These guys love having these birds live on their ranches. And they live on the ditches they dug by hand. And they love them. And even Dwayne generously told me once, you'll never get rid of all those prairie dogs and you wouldn't want to anyway because the birds love them. But we have prioritized for one species over another and that wheel is wobbling. I told that to Mark Davidson during the ag plan process and um, I think working with the Audubon Society and honestly, if you did something about the prairie dogs, you could take some of those lands that are out of production because of prairie dog habitat and have more leasable lands for Andre. But um, it doesn't matter because you can't farm without <coughs> topsoil either and we watch it blow away all the time. And it is heartbreaking that I can put numbers to it. Um, just for example, the 367 acres of hay fields that are occupied by prairie dogs now. It's easy, I've heard, oh, you'll never be able to figure out a c calculation for it. US VA Department of Colorado Agriculture, 3.68 tons per acre yield last year, average price 168, it comes to $226,000. I mean, I can put figures to it. And that's just the hay, not the cattle. We're going backwards, that is not sustainable. We need to, so, uh, vi well, I have a couple guys I think of as my village chiefs. And one of them, I won't say which one, graciously told me a few years ago that I think we made a mistake with this prairie dog thing. And I don't think he meant having some prairie dogs. He just meant having nothing to take care of the places where they overlap. And that is starting to show up in a hurry. And for every hour I spend on Duane's operation is comprised of county and city properties. He manages a huge chunk of this landscape. And um, he was over at a county meeting yesterday, which we spend as much time on the prairie dog issue over there. And it's come to a point where we have our set operating numbers, which are big, these are big businesses. It takes a lot of capital to operate them. Mm -hmm. And they have set it on a number. You could wrap up. Okay, anyway, he was told, we told him what some of our losses were and he was told that he might wanna consider a different occupation. And that's not okay. Okay, thank you, thank Al. Thank you, thank you. So uh, with that, we close uh, the public comment part of the agenda and go to matters from the department. And I probably should mention, in case anyone has been looking at the agenda, the, the Boulder Open Space Conservancy issue, which had been scheduled for, uh, well, would have been this meeting, the March 13th edition of it, will, that issue will be taken up at our next meeting on April 10th. Sorry, everyone. I have my mic off, sorry. Hi everyone. So we are here tonight <coughs> to give you an update to date on our fourth engagement window, which we are in the middle of, uh, nearing the conclusion of. Want to just touch on how we're starting to move towards a draft and final plan. It's getting pretty exciting. 
and talk just a little bit about, as a light touch, what future planning might look like after the master plan. That's something that we'll introduce tonight, but expect further conversation throughout the year and even into next year. So to date, just as a brief reminder where how we got to this engagement window, um, we used so much engagement and input from uh, staff and the community over the fall to develop the draft outcomes and strategies and worked with you at the most recently at the February study session to revise those, then worked with our staff to produce the latest version that was brought to the community at our recent community workshop. And those materials are also available online. And we got 70 people at our workshop, which we were thrilled about, um, especially given some of the, some of the scheduling um, issues that emerged um, with city council. But we got some uh, comments from the community on those outcomes and strategies, although we were pleased to see that they were fairly minor, which to us means that we really are moving towards consensus. And so, as we move into the draft plan, you might see some minor adjustments to the language of those outcomes and strategies, but they will be just that minor. And so um, I wanna give kudos honestly to the board for your work on that and representing the public feedback and moving us towards that, that place of consensus. Oops. And so, as you might also remember from our February study session, we did not have as much time as we had hoped to talk about those guiding principles, and so, I wanted to bring those up here in just an overview slide. I'll bring the slide back up at the end of my presentation and, and we expect um, and welcome discussion from you on those tonight. But just as a reminder, um, we, these are also already a reflection of input from the board and even community and so we also wanna thank and recognize the work that you've done on these and um, we're particularly excited even about that very first one about uniting conservation and recreation. We're really moving towards um, some pretty inspiring language as it relates to that and, and some of the others as well. We also wanna point out with these two that because they sit above or, or it, they, they talk to all of our focus areas, they talk to all of our strategies and really would guide the way we implement the master plan, they're also uh, starting to, to shape up as operational guidance for us as a department that um, even beyond the master plan, there are certain uh, functions that we provide that these would inform. And so just wanna thank the board again for offering up the strategic guidance at this level. And so in this engagement window, as I know you all know by this point, what we've used our final focus areas, financial sustainability, to, as the lens through which we would integrate and prioritize those outcomes and strategies. Um, and we have set up a series of funding scenarios and, and we'll discuss this more with the board in April in a couple of weeks, um, but presented these to the public at the workshop and have been able with working with city staff to kind of update the, the way we talk about these. You might remember in, in the past in our project management plan, we talked about producing um, an action plan or a vision plan. We realized that the, that language doesn't really make sense to us or to the community and so the, the, the titles of these scenarios have been updated to make them more meaningful for us and just wanted to point that out. And so again, first scenario being uh, kind of our, our current conditions where we have a 30% reduction in the amount of city sales tax revenue dedicated to OSMP. That second scenario being the one in which uh, funding is restored to 2018 levels through a sales tax measure of some kind. And the remaining third scenario being additional funding diversified package um, beyond that the, uh, 2018 levels. And I know that we also at that February study session worked um, in depth with you on defining the questions for the statistically valid survey. And again, wanna thank you for that. Um, if you remember the work around the question about if you had $100, um, that question itself has been lifted out as I know you know at the workshop, we did an exercise around that in person where um, members of the community were able to put stones in the jar um, representing a certain amount of money. Uh, we've also pulled that um, exercise out into a set of micro engagements. And so uh, we were lucky to work with our partners at El Centro Amistad to uh, host another focus, area, um, focus group um, at which we had 24 participants from I believe eight different countries. Uh, we worked with our um, partners at Youth Opportunities Advisory Board with about 15 high school students doing the same exercise. Um, we've worked with uh, people experiencing disabilities through some of our partnerships to get that same feedback around that exercise as well as reaching out via email to our uh, lessees. 
And so just as a recap about about the statistically valid survey, um, we did get in total uh, about 100, over 170 comments um, from board council and our process committee to get us to that final version, which again is just a tremendous amount of work and thought. So thank you for that. We did take it to city council and got their ultimate support of, of the questions themselves. And all surveys have been mailed out. So that's a pretty big milestone. <laughs> So congrats to all of us. <laughs> um, we then have made the, those same questions available online. Um, as some of you may know, we did uh, experience a little bit of te technical difficulties translating some of the formatting of those questions into our online version, but those have been corrected. Um, and that'll be open until April 7th. And uh, we plan to come back to you on May 8th uh, and present and introduce our draft plan, which will be the result of input from the survey as well as the rest of the engagement window, um, and present also on the survey findings themselves. And then we'll send that similar information to City Council on May 9th via an information packet and be available for an informal briefing with City Council on May 14th. I'm sorry, that says it's May 14th. It's just recently been changed. And so just as a reminder what we're doing with all of this input, we really are, again, working towards that draft plan. Um, and that'll be available to the public on May 8th for a couple of weeks through the 22nd. And we'll use that input then to inform a joint study session with our four full board and city council on June 11th, and then have our subsequent study session with just the board that following evening on June 12th. We'll then use that input and guidance to inform uh, the next iteration of the draft plan, which would be available for review by both uh, OSBT and the planning board. <coughs> and then we are asking for city council approval on uh, September 3rd. So it's getting close. Yeah. So as we think about that future where the master plan is adopted, um, there are additional planning needs, we know that. Um, and we've always talked about that the kind of strategies the master plan would develop are sort of in three buckets, so to speak. One is around uh, plans, future plans that we may need. One is around uh, projects or programs, and the other is around policies. And so I wanna just talk about one sort of set of those, po uh, those strategies, and those are the plans um, that the master plan is guiding as we look to the future. And so we know through a series of those strategies that there are needs and opportunities to address sort of some system-wide components um, as we manage open space into the future. And we see the opportunity and need to look at those, again, system-wide as um, uh, inputs to our next master plan. And so some of these may be components where we update elements of a particular plan that already exists. For example, the grassland plan, it's, in, it's a wonderfully strong plan, but there are perhaps elements we might need to look at to update. Um, whereas there are others that have emerged, um, like the need for developing a management approach to water. That's something that we currently don't have. And then we also see the need and opportunity to develop a uh, set of area plans as we move into the future. And this is not a new uh, development for us. It's something that we've actually been doing for decades as a department. Uh, for example, with our TSA planning or even some of our grassland planning or agricultural planning where we're looking at a subset of our system. And this is also the opportunity to bring in at that level as we look towards an integrated approach to those area plans, uh, some initial conversations around site planning where we're developing some initial guidance around the goals and concepts that might be explored further um, for particular locations within those geographies. And really as we look to how plans inform the development of our capital improvement program and our work plans, uh, both the master plan guides those things, future area plans will also guide the, uh, the, both the CIP and our work plans, and we know that there are also elements, again, the functions that we provide that also inform the CIP and work plans, but again, we're just focusing on the ways that plans um, inform those elements. And so again, here's just sort of a synopsis as we look at the kinds of area planning we've done in the past, the kinds of planning we've done for our, our uh, four quadrants of the system. Um, Again, we've looked at grassland planning, um, agricultural planning. We've, we also have some precedent in the past of, for example, our South Boulder Creek Area Management Plan, 
or in the case of the North area, we've done a North Boulder, Va North Boulder Valley area management plan, um, as well as our TSAs in the past. And so uh, recognizably, the East is where we do not have any existing TSA planning. Um, we've also heard from staff that there is interest and need emerging from the strategies in the master plan, again, to update elements of the grassland plan. And so as we think again, just uh, initially, as we open up the conversation about what our future planning may need to be, um, we anticipate the need for area plans in the east and the south. And again, that would include uh, some element of site planning within those processes. We see the need to update elements of our existing system-wide plans, again, uh, with the grasslands, as well as our, our forest uh, ecology management plan. Um, and we've established, for example, a strategy in the master plan where we talk about the need for developing a visitor use management toolkit. Well, that indicates the need for uh, perhaps updates to elements of the visitor master plan. And again, we also have seen um, an emerge an emerging need for uh, system-wide planning uh, for water and cultural resources uh, throughout the development of the master plan. And again, we see tonight as sort of a light touch, an introduction and opening up of this conversation. Um, we anticipate that through the development of the draft plan, uh, as it goes through um, the study session and then board and planning board review and council, we'll get uh, future input on a sort of a general approach, a general sort of short-term, mid-term, long-term approach to which of these plans we might need to do in which general order. But then following the adoption of the master plan, we have the commitment to come back to the board uh, at the end of this year or early next year to then talk in more depth about the scope and the process and the approach to uh, what these area plans may need to be. Um, and so just wanted to make that clear also. And so just to summarize some of our next steps, and then I wanna open it back up for conversation and we'll bring the slide back up about guiding principles. Our, the engagement window that we're in right now, engagement window four, closes on April 7th. That's when the online questionnaire <coughs> closes. Um, we'll be preparing uh, a great, I'm pretty excited about the conversation that we'll have with you in a couple of weeks. Kevin, we'll, we'll miss you, certainly, um, where we're talking about financial sustainability and our approach to funding scenarios and what that means from a prioritization standpoint. And then again, we'll come back as a presentation with staff and move through the sec uh, th move through the schedule there. I've summarized it um, in other places, but um, I'll give you a minute here to digest any of these dates. You've seen them before, but if you have any questions about this or the rest of my presentation, certainly let me know. Um, and thank you. <laughs> any questions on the schedule before I? No. Okay. Oh, Karen. I. I have a quick question on the schedule, sure. um, and it came up today because the new survey <coughs> has been promoted on Nextdoor and publicly on email lists and so forth. And I think because there's an overlap of the window for <coughs> online input and the survey that Mary suggested the format changes on, the overlap of those two public input survey, online surveys, is causing some confusion in the public. And people think that they just did the survey, so they must have already done that. I don't know what the answer is about how to distinguish those two, but I think it's really important from the public's perspective to make sure that the public knows that there are two different surveys going right now. And that just because they've just finished the OSMP survey doesn't mean they've finished both of those. Because one's looking at financial priorities, if I'm not wrong. So let me make sure I understand. So uh, I, I think the window four survey, which is follow up from the public meeting last Monday, is still open, right? So the, yes. The and then today was announced the new survey, which parallels the statistically uh, valid sampling survey. We actually only have one questionnaire out online. Those two aren't different? No. No. So the, the uh -huh. work that we did to craft and confirm the language for the statistically valid survey is exactly the same as what's online. And that's exactly the same as the follow-up from the open house? Correct. 
There's only one survey op questionnaire open online I right now. thought the window for one following up from the open house was different. No. No. Okay. Just have one. But thank you for pointing out that confusion. We can certainly clarify that in, in a follow-up email to our listservs. Yeah, there's only one open. There is, you know, we know we mailed uh, the actual statistically valid uh, surveys to 6,000 question uh, to 6,000 households. households yeah. So there is the chance we recognize that those same people, you know, th there's perhaps an overlap there in terms of whether they sent us the mailed version and answered online. But the input, if you were not able to come Monday <coughs> night to the community meeting, then you should answer this survey is the same one that was announced again today by the department. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We would definitely be happy to send out a clarification on this. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was it was the the way that they were announced as what people should be doing and why that I think was confusing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Yep. <coughs> All right. So any other? <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. It's not particularly on scheduling, but it does have to do with the survey. Is it okay if I jump? Of course, over to that? absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. As I got the digital survey um, late last week, I sort of had this moment of pondering where I'm like, well, wait a minute, we're doing this statistically valid survey, and now I've got a sur I've got the same survey, which will make this not statistically valid. That's because right. because obviously this becomes a very biased sample. What are you going to do with this? And my thinking was is that like asking people to do something and then not using it, like, please fill out the survey, but we're not going to use it because we're using the statistically valid survey. It's kind of disingenuous for the time involved. But then I had this other thought, and I think that this might be something that the data nerd in me really likes and that you guys might be able to use. You're now going to have a measure of the bias of people. So you're going to see the difference between statistically valid sample of Boulder and the people who actually pipe up based on online surveys, come to meetings, whatever. And you might be able to tease enough out of that so that in the future when you're doing stuff, you can say, well, we generally have a feeling like this is not representative and the values that are expressed in an online survey we get are different from like the populace at large in this way. And that might be something that you could really talk to when you get these results in um, because I think people will wonder what the hell did I just fill this online survey out for if the statistically valid one is the one that was mailed out and I don't count. And this might be a good way to, to evaluate that. Um, and I also think it's probably really valuable to say here's what the online survey said, but if you really want the, the like a valid survey, you need to be really clear that like we can't use this in the same way. Like if you really want to know what the values of the people of Boulder are, you can't use the online survey, except to say the people who are online feel differently from the actual people of Boulder in this way, so now we know. Um, and, and I think that's really important, uh, especially since I filled it out 18 times. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's checking the IP addresses. Different IPs, yes. <laughs> yeah. At the public library through all their computers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. We do appreciate that. And we do have the intention of in the survey findings to show that comparison. Okay. Yep. <coughs> okay. So I'm in, going to pull the slide back up. Of May the, I just make oh, a, yeah. another comment about, and I think it has to do with what you were just showing about the interaction of the master plan with the system plans and so forth. Okay. It, it has to do with page three in the information that was in the packet mm -hmm. about proposal that focuses on four geographic areas. Um, I didn't understand why all of a sudden we were shifting to four geographic areas and how that, what that had to do with, what the advantage of that was and what the rationale behind it is. Uh, are we gonna have an opportunity to discuss that and go in depth about that? Because it wasn't clear to me what the advantage was of parsing things by four geographic areas all of a sudden. Yes, so absolutely, again, we wanted to open the conversation tonight knowing we couldn't close it. We'd like there to be additional process around it. And in fact, we wanna reach out to the process committee to get further guidance about how best to do that within the master plan. 
Um, but we will say, Karen, just initially that those are proposed based on the existing boundaries for the TSA planning. And so there would be no change to that. It would more be the shift would be rather than rolling out a set of um, or c completing our TSA plans uh, for our four quadrants. As we move, for example, into the east part of the system, we would do an in we would approach it from an integrated standpoint where we're looking at all charter purposes, still with the same opportunities to discuss trail connections or experiences, et cetera, et cetera, but also in line with, um, you know, grassland needs, agricultural needs, et cetera. So. And the implication is that the other TSA plans were done outside of the charter purposes, or N no, no. No criticism, or, or but we're we're looking at a way in terms of um, being able to provide an equal amount of guidance <coughs> for our charter purposes, uh, looking towards those area plans to do that. And so we might, you know, in our previous TSA approach, have focused on perhaps although they're uh, around trails and visitor experience and and the amenities needed to support that. We've done that certainly within the context of charter purposes, no doubt. Um, but wanting to bring online at an equivalent level of guidance, it, again, to inform our CIP and our work plans, the kinds of needs and opportunities around uh, ecosystem restoration or um, uh, looking at ag agricultural needs, pulling in the agricultural plan and providing an equivalent amount of guidance around all of those. So is the vision that issues like um, Boulder Valley Farms or some of the other larger properties that we've acquired on the east side for which there's no their current management plan, that they would be folded into some sort of east side planning process that, as you say, transcends the, not just trails, it's all the ag issues and other broader set of issues. Yeah, and, and the point is that we're not seeing any decisions made tonight. As Darren pointed out, the idea is to go back to the process committee and say, what level of detail should we get to on describing how we do planning in the future in the master plan, bring that back to the board for discussion, and then in the master plan, there's kind of an action plan piece that talks, as Darren said earlier, projects, policies, programs, plans. So we get that their policy direction, and then the goal is that uh, by next summer, we'd be coming back to the board and through a series of meetings, but probably by next summer, 2020, I should say, would then be saying to the board, yeah, he, is this the right way we'll move forward with the planning from a system level and an area level in the future? And that's when we'll be making, you know, the final decisions on that. So this is just to open up initial conversation. Right. Oh, that, that makes sense to me because I think the question of how best to tackle the various planning issues that are on the five or 10 year horizon is actually quite a complicated one. Mm -hmm. And I don't personally think the master plan needs to lay all of that out in great detail because some of that's actually pretty complicated stuff, and I would just say my own two cents is we need to be mindful of uh, how long some of these bigger planning processes take, and that, you know, we're a long, long ways from implementing the North TSA, which was basically done three years ago, and that we need to be careful of are there issues like the Gun Barrel Hill one, which sort of got, would otherwise have been in the East <coughs> TSA, but sort of got pulled out, and be mindful of are there other situations where we really ought to pull something out of some more macro level planning process and say, let's have something that's targeted mm -hmm. at that where it's, you know, kind of a manageable set of issues that can be handled relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. I think we may discover that there's a, actually a fair amount of that out there of problems that really ought to be tackled um, and, you know, a, some sort of mega plan that's going to take a very long time to get done and even further to get implemented may not in all cases be the right tool. But I think that's just a way of saying, I think there's actually a, a serious question about how best to complete the rest of the system. And, you know, the master plan probably doesn't need to define all of that at a great level of detail, but it does sort of, you know, <coughs> And trigger the process of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that, you know, at some levels, that's that policy direction the master plan would provide to move forward and, hey, in a year, get it figured out. One one thing I think is interesting that Darren and I and Steve had spoke about today, and I know Kurt had said, yes, please take your time on this process. And that's He's not here tonight, but he'd said, let's really think about it and get some public involvement, get board approval, as it were. 
But we know the master plan itself got a project management plan that the board recommended an approval on, that went to council, got approval. That's proven incredibly useful for us as staff that thought that you get the scope and the project management in place before you move ahead with a plan. And we know to the future that there's that level of details then provided where we're supported by the board in the process, as it were. And what's the type of process we need to make that happen? Well, that's in the project management plan. So again, just another way of saying that is that w before we would embark on an actual one of those, we would come to you similar to how we did with a project management plan. We would do that with, say, an East Area plan or whatever that next step is. Mm -hmm. um, so as you guys move forward in, in, in pitching us on area planning, <laughs> um, one thing I would like for you to speak strongly about is lessons learned from the TSA processes. Um, as I read through the packet item on area planning, like I, 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 I think I started going into PTSD because <laughs> like, I was like, oh my God, this sounds a lot like a TSA. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's because I, I, we saw how uh, in all of the TSA processes, community passions run extremely high. And I think that's because in a sense, the TSAs, people would bring in things outside of trails as things to weigh against the trail study process. It wasn't trails taken in a vacuum. And so I can see that area planning has some, so taking a greater context and weighing all the different components of the system is, is appropriate. That said, I'll be really interested again to, to see what we've learned from the TSA process. And very early on, I'd like to start thinking about like what the community input proce process might look like mm -hmm. under an area mm -hmm. plan. Okay, thank you. Great. And Kind of adding to that because I was going to have a matter from the board and now I'll just talk about it now anyways, <clears throat> is um, I'm really struggling with unending public process. And I think that this needs to be critically addressed shortly and in this um, as a way of dealing with it is we can't have a public process for the big area, then a public process for a small area, then revisit the smaller pro area process because of a stream crossing over and over and over and over again. It's unfair to the public who are really concerned about something to have them have to come over and over and over again to express their, their interests. I don't know what the solution is, but I think that's the biggest failing that I've seen from the TSA is that we say, that, great, we're gonna go do this, and then as we've seen over and over again, like, oh no, we're not gonna put a pier on Wonderland, like, well wait, we already agreed we're gonna do that. That was part of a compromise, and now we're visiting this one little area as part of this bigger thing, and people are frustrated. So finding some way to streamline this, I don't think the answer to, to your problems is more public process. I think the answer is more decisiveness, with a better, more concrete plan from the beginning from staff so that people have a really clear idea of what's gonna happen. Then they can say, I don't like it or I do like it or change it this way and then don't ask them again, just go do it. Um, as much as the extent possible within the law, et cetera, et cetera. Because I think that you'll get a better result. And generally people don't like change. So if you keep bringing up ideas about change over and over again, you're gonna keep running into people who don't like it. And so come up with the right thing to do. And I actually think this is a great time to, to visit that in this master plan. I have one, one more master plan idea if you want to put back up your um, whatever the, 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 the blue bars with all the Guiding things. principles. That one. So, and this is something I feel like I've closed my circle because um, when I first got here, the first thing I said was I think that if you want to have better environmental management, you need to have recreation management. And when I talked about that, we talked about the visitor master plan and said, well, we're not really gonna make big changes to that because we're gonna revamp this whole thing and we're gonna turn it into the master plan. And then we're gonna really think about how we're gonna deal with recreation and whether we need a recreation master plan. And the last few times that I've brought this up in various big scale plans, that's been the, the, the thing, wait till the master plan. We're here now. I think if you want to unite conservation and recreation, you need to have a comprehensive recreation management plan. It needs to be a separate entity. It's not the visitor experience plan, it's a recreation management system. So that you really have an idea of how to minimize environmental impact by creating a positive recreation experience. I think you're already on the right track. I'm just saying that I think that that would speak volumes to your intent to manage recreation 
yes, for the sake of making sure the environment's better, but for the sake of making recreation better, which is what a lot of the public wants as well. And I think that it needs to have its own status and it needs to be called recreation or fun or something like that. It's, it's, it's needs to be very clear that that's what you're trying to say. Because I think that that gives the people the clarity that they need about what your, this part of that uniting is. And that was my other thing. Okay. So are we now kicking it back to you or? I'm opening it up to just <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. So we, we're gonna talk about guiding principles now? Okay. Uh, I'll throw a bomb. Um, <laughs> I get a little tired of why Boulder feels that we all must, must always be exceptional and a leader in everything. And when, at a time when we are strapped financially, there's gonna be so many things to act upon in this master plan. Why do we feel compelled to innovate and lead in sustainability and resilience? Can staff speak to that? But I, I, it, let, me, let me add on. Yeah. I see value in that for inspiring staff. That's like the one thing that makes it important to me is like, I want you guys to show up and enjoy doing your jobs. That's important to me. But for the, for the sake of being an innovator and, and have the rest of the world look up to us, that part doesn't interest me as much. I think you've hit the nail on the head for a component of it because we have had some pretty great conversations about how we do that and how we use the master plan to, to motivate and, and organize ourselves. Right? <clears throat> and that's, that's the central, one of the central components and purposes of it. That one in particular emerged from the need as we look at infrastructure, even if it's a repair, even if it's a, a you know, capital enhancement uh, or new trails or any, you know, from that perspective, that we want to be doing that in a way that is respecting and integrating the ecosystem needs, for example and the resilience needs and the mm -hmm. climate action commitment that we have as a city and trying to be a partner with, for example, with other city departments in that effort and making sure that we're um, playing our part. And so I think that's probably the, you know, the, the heart, Andrea, of where that one emerged from, but I don't know. Um, Good answer. Yeah. So let me, um, try and rephrase in my own words to see if I, I got it. So mm -hmm. it's more, this is less about innovate and lead and more about being, taking the sustainability and resilience components that are cross-departmental to heart and working with that in the context of the master plan. I think, that's a, I think that's a fair way of saying it, although the okay. one the one caveat I might say is that I think that the part about, um, you know, our legacy, <laughs> from our tagline. I think that um, our community and our staff is feels very lucky and proud to be a part of a community that passed the first municipal, municipal tax for open space. Mm. That is one of the first communities to have uh, purchased and preserved land, uh, you know, in the 19th century. And so I think there's a component of that where we're also trying to pull that, that aspect of our legacy forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No. I, I totally agree with you, Andrea, and um, and I I sort of bristle every time I read it in one of these documents too. And my question is, can we get out of the best of the best, unending expense of pursuing this to the, be the best in the world kind of thing by pairing it with what Kurt wrote us a memo about? the constraints of the reality of how much we can invest in any one of the things on here, because there are real economic and staff constraints to doing any of this. And that, to me, points for the, the real need in the guiding principles of some statement about the realities of the economic and, and staffing constraints of what we can actually do and that's a missing principle that doesn't exist yet. And it's fine with me to wait till after we grapple with some of the financial mm. issues in April. But I think it's essential that we have 
that kind of a principle also, that these aren't just open-ended principles that we're gonna conquer the world and do the best of you know, anybody on the face of the earth, but there are realities that constrain it. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a do the best we can with what we got, you know, could be another guiding principle. Like, even in my bad English, <laughs> well, that's what the zero in and one is, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe that it's is do the best with what we got. I think it's intended to. I yeah. Mean, maybe wording yeah. issues, but I think it's intended to do that. Yeah. But I, ha, have you had a chance to read Kurt's memo? Because he, he addresses that, um, the need for, for something extra in addition to what's here now. So I just want to say, I don't think zeroing in as written is at all what I'm saying. Okay. This is saying we can't do it all, so we must be con cost conscious. And what I'm saying is, no, 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 we, we do the best with what we've got is a different sort of statement. Instead of like, let's do go for efficiency, it's like, how do we milk every, everything out of this? And so this is saying, you know, we must be cost conscious and focus our efforts where the biggest needs are, where we can make the biggest difference. And I guess I'm trying to say something a little bit more folksy out of it, which is like, we got X, we're gonna do as much as we can with it. And I don't know. It feels and, it, and if Kurt were here, I think he would say and, and then go on with his, his concept. So I think, <clears throat> I think we really need to have a robust discussion about this extra guiding principle that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. That and, and talks about the, what it says <clears throat> and how it frames the financial commitment. And I think, Karen, yeah, we, we'd be happy to work on that and bring it back for when we get to that point. It does speak to the, and Kurt did put the input in there, which we're happy to use and bring back to you guys once we develop that. Uh, there is that term in Britain, make, do, and mend, <laughs> which means kind of getting to Kevin's point, how do you make the most of what you've got? And sometimes it's looking, for instance, at the life cycle of what we have in ecosystems or in our trail system. And sometimes we're looking at short-term fixes. When you tend to have more money, you tend to take care of those sort of urgent needs. And we might be looking at more of the important things over the longer term. And how do we make that more effect cost-effective? Or how do we better utilize staff resources to manage the system in a more constrained environment? That is a new world as a department for us. And so I think as a guiding principle, we need, we need to figure out exact wording for that and how that goes forward. Steve mentioned it's, it might not be that we can gold plate everything, but what can we do as a system to keep it between fair and good condition instead of everything in good condition? What's that reality look like? And that will be a, a great conversation to have that guidance in the master plan as then we get into the implementation piece next year. And I think the other thing that I guess in my mindset is that is as it is in zero in, you get a sense of money. And I think you have things like human volunteer labor that really stands out as, in my idea of like do the most with what you got. Is like we got a lot of people. Last night I wore, was out helping fix a trail that got ran over by a motorcycle. And like 30 people showed up out of the woodwork on a Tuesday night. Like staff labor for Boulder County was, was one person and everyone else was volunteer and we got a lot done. Mm. So I think that's a that's a, a whole thing that's not tapped into by cost effectiveness. Okay, this is helpful. Yeah. I would add a I don't know if it's a separate guiding principle or is part of all voices, but it's <coughs> it is somewhat different, and it's an explicit recognition of to use the buzz phrase social equity, but there's two distinct components here. One is the process, which is what's recognized by the all voices, which is to hear from people who we don't normally hear from. That's actually different from recognition of social equity as an actual sort of planning objective. That is that the system, as it exists, you know, kind of on the ground, ought to be uh, developed, managed, uh, revised, with an eye towards sort of um, what is the broader equity within which we're operating here? And it's, you know, 
sort of one of the dirty little secrets of open space that it's not a secret that we're funded with a sales tax, which tends to be regressive, but it is what it is. I mean, that's how we're funded. We're not going to change that, I don't think. But it is a truism of that is how we get our money. But as our survey showed, the average user of open space makes 100000 a year. And I, you know, I suspect that statistic is actually biased downward by the fact that um, some of those people probably are retired who their actual income might be low, but their, you know, accrued income over life might be somewhat higher. And I think anyone who spends time on open space knows full well what I'm talking about here, that the, um, when you go around open space, you almost never hear someone speaking Spanish, and it is very different than the visitor center, um, about the visitor center in Eldo State Park or at M.G. Fine Park, that there's an enormous demographic difference in different parts of our system. Or frankly, if you go look at who is fishing at KOA Lake, um, that is a very different group of people. Um, than who you're probably going to see at Wonderland Lake. And to just, I don't have any magic answers, but I think it is something that we um, have tended not to think about, um, that we ought to be thinking about, about what is sort of some of the, and it gets into these issues of also with parking, frankly, where if someone wants to use parking as their mechanism for controlling access to something, we ought to also candidly recognize that that is not a socially equal uh, solution. There are efficiencies and reasons to use parking. It's not all on the bad side, but it obviously gives a huge advantage to people who can afford to live typically on the very western edge of town within walking distance of open space and, you know, has a, in that sense, has a very <coughs> unequal effect, even within Boulder, never mind, you know, how you would take into account some of the surrounding communities. So. I'm not proposing specific language, but I think, anyhow, you get the concept. And it's not to sort of criticize ourselves, but to recognize going forward that maybe there are some broader social considerations that like we don't have enough already to think about um, that we ought to be, you know, kind of wrapping into this, these processes. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to echo, you know, Tom's comments. Um, I think as it's worded here, there's, it's really valuable that I think you've done a great job of saying like how you're going to reach out to try and essentially hear a broader range of, of community input. Um, I think there is this other side of this that I think you kind of touched on, and if I got what you're saying wrong, please correct me, but I sort of feel as if there, there's an issue of not just allowing people's voices to be heard, but making the open space experience more broadly palatable to to not just so that you have those pe those other voices actually being out on open space um, instead of just coming to a meeting and saying what they'd like to see there or, or maybe not coming at all. So I, I don't know how that works. I think maybe just a little bit of tweaking in the language to say something along the lines of that, that the goal is to to increase um, the um, excitement and usability for this broader range of people. And um, I believe it was Tom in, in the email comment that you wrote about the plants and wildlife have fundamental rights. Um, it, was that you who wrote that or? Some yes. Else. Well, I, yeah. I, I thought I said it to you. Did that get yeah. down? We forwarded okay. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. fine. Um, and, <laughs> and, and my feeling is strongly like as a conservation biologist, no. Um, we have great respect and love for them. We need to care for them. Plants and wildlife don't have sentience and the ability to come and speak for what they want or need. And I, I think that they're, they're, they're not expressing a voice in this process either. I think it's really important that we do conservation. I'm not sure that this is the right um, guiding principle for, for their, the, the value of those things. I think it, in, in part it trivializes how important conservation is by people saying, well, I brought in a dandelion and it's going to talk to you now or something, and that makes it really not very valuable. So um, I think place is someplace else. Is there general consensus from at least the four of you here that, that there's preference to either remove or revise that? Oh yeah, those two last, last two sentences can go. 
I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that I don't value conservation. I think it's really important. I think that it just makes it sound kind of hokey to put it in here. Well, I mean, these, these guiding principles work in operation with um, the charter purposes, and there's a lot of conservation there. Yeah. You know, I think we're, it, it, I mean, I, I read the guiding principles as ways to knit parts of the, of the charter together, the charter purposes, and things that, as, you know, as we've all talked about, override, or ride on top of and try and knit together things we're talking about in the master plan. Conservation will not be left behind. I'm pretty clear. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It might help to hear how you see these being placed within the master plan itself, given what Andrea has just said. From an outline perspective, sort of. Or, so we see them coming in, we've always said that the, um, the general structure of the master plan at the very end, one of the last sections, is that kind of general action plan. So it's giving kind of a general arc about the short-term, mid-term, and long-term work that we'll get to work on. Um, something exciting is happening back there. <laughs> sure. uh, if you're nice, oh. we'll send you the dessert <laughs> over your way. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not used to seeing so many smiles when it talks to all the work we have to do. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, Karen, we see Adrian. I, I, I'm, I'm especially yeah. interested in what comes first before the guiding principles and. The and strategies themselves. To, to precede yeah. them with. Yeah, so it will be the outcomes and the strategies themselves. That really is the heart of the master plan. Um, the, the guiding principles come as a way, I think Andrea said it well, to knit together our charter purposes, to, to, to speak about how we'll go about the work of implementing those strategies and advancing the outcomes. And so, you know, as we were indicating earlier, they have relevance for us even around our, the other functions that perhaps aren't as directly um, addressed by our master plan, even around our, you know, enforcement or community rangering or, you know, um, some of our ongoing programs. And so they, they also kind of provide some of that operational guidance. And so, Karen, that's why we sort of see it sitting in the action plan component of, of the overall master plan document. Does that help? And then the, the kinds of mission statements and charter purposes and all. Right up front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add with the guiding principles, it, it did come out of the um, discussions with the community and actually with yourselves, the board, when we started to see these things emerge as these operating principles. Um, it's interesting, you know, Lauren will be coming to you soon, for instance, with a budget package. Is guiding principles in the budget package. They don't decide the dollar amount, but they set a framework for thinking about the process and how we operate the budget. So we, I guess that's another analogy the way to think about these. And we know it wasn't in the original scope of the master plan. It was something that emerged. And I think the sense from staff was, oh yeah, this is useful as we get into, for instance, the implementation of the strategies and the outcomes. These are some guiding principles to think about. And, and that's why I, I agree with Kurt about the need for a guiding principle about what are we going to invest in. Great. We, and we will absolutely, the, the discussion around these guiding principles is by no means closing tonight. And, and we'll continue to discuss that at the study session as well as in the draft plan as it goes through review. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I just want to add, I think we may very well hear from members of the community who feel very strongly about those last two sentences. Do you have any guidance for us around how best <laughs> to anticipate or address that? Maybe they'll show up at our next meeting and we can hear directly from them. Okay. Okay. All right, well, as always, thank you so much. We really appreciate the strategic guidance, yes. I have one more nerd question. Yeah. Um, the jars that you yeah. put the stones in, yeah. <laughs> clear or opaque? <laughs> they are, we would call them translucent. So people could see how many stones were in there. Oh, oh, the jars. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So bias, yep. because people would see and think someone else voted that way. Should I vote that way because I'm a joiner? 
should I vote against them? It's so fast. Were you there that night? I couldn't be there. I was well because there were other there was bias from the other direction happening. Yeah. Because there were people going around the room saying, "Hey, did you see the amount of stones in that jar? Go over and put <laughs> yours in that one." <laughs> so there was both kinds of. I, I mean, I just I can just envision you having two different nights, one with opaque jars and ones with clear <laughs> jars. <laughs> see the experiment. difference. Yeah. <laughs> jars are in the. Um, uh, are the opaque jars are in the statistically valid survey. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. yeah. I, I'm just fascinated. Right. Yeah, totally. like, Thank you very much, Darren. Um, next up, we have Jim Reeder, who will share an update relative to the uh, trails open house that we recently had. Good evening, board. Um, Jim Reeder, trails and facilities manager. Um, as <coughs> Steve indicated, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes uh, with you talking a little bit about our recently held trail uh, open house. We hope that that becomes the first annual. Uh, that's our plan. And so we would like to get <coughs> the purpose of, of tonight's presentation really is to get your impressions of, <coughs> of that meeting. Um, as you, uh, I'm sure, know, the goal of that meeting was to inform the public of not only the projects that we got done in 2018, but also to look forward to the uh, projects that we're planning to do in 2019. Uh, 20 <laughs> well, what is it we're getting? In 2019, we have <laughs> 17 projects that, that we highlighted, uh, and um, those are in all kinds of stages of development, from planning to design to permitting uh, to construction. Um, putting that uh, project or that open house together take quite a bit of work uh, from a lot of sp a lot of people, about 20 different uh, staff members from uh, communications, uh, ecological staff, signs, trails, uh, trailheads, um, administration, all those folks. And at the end of the day, I think they all felt that it was well worth it. Although go going into it, I'm not sure they were all convinced. <laughs> Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I think they did feel it was all worth it. I do want to give a special shout out to uh, Greg Seebloom uh, because he really drove that uh, project. Um, he, his project was highlighted, one of those uh, that we talked about with the Upper Bear Canyon reroute, and you've got a, a, a memo in the, the packet about that particular project. Um, but uh, we did talk, like I say, about 17 uh, different projects. Uh, at the end of the night, I felt very positive about it. Uh, I had several people come up to me and thank me uh, for doing that, thank us for doing that uh, meeting and uh, th with the hope that we would do it again and we certainly plan on doing that. Um, we did receive, uh, as we expected, some criticism, some thoughts about how we could have done, done things differently, uh, particularly on some of our trail alignments and, uh, and, and uh, our, some of our uh, stone walls that we use to uh, support those trails. So we'll, we'll learn from that, uh, take those in consideration. Um, but at the present time, uh, I'd just like to open it up to you and, and have you respond, uh, give us any uh, indication on how we can make that better. Uh, we are very much interested in, in uh, continual uh, improvement, uh, small steps, um, and uh, so I'll just open it up for, for conversation. Um, I'll go first. My kids were very appreciative of the snacks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and um, one thing that, uh, and I thought it was a great event, and one thing that made it a great event for me was this, the, the staff to everyone else ratio. Like I felt like I could get my questions answered, mm. I could have a meaningful conversation, and that was just being sufficiently staffed up for that meeting was fantastic, so thank you. Um, one thing that went missing for me specifically in my questions of uh, the Bear Canyon project is what it would look like. So, you know, you have a clear vision of, of what's, what kinds of um, rock work, uh, st number of steps, uh, you know, trying to get above a, a certain rock band or something like that is mm. going to be required for the, pro the project. But I guess because I'm such a visual person, if you had like, a similar a photo of a similar stone staircase elsewhere on the system and put that up on the poster board, it would just bring home the project for okay. me much more strongly. 
Yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah. Good suggestion. Good idea. Yeah. I agree with Andrea. I thought it was very well done and an important thing to be doing. And I like the idea of doing it annually. Mm -hmm. um, the one additional part that, that I think would have helped, and it's, it's not that I needed it. I could see where these reroutes fit with previous, for instance, TSA plans. But for people who don't track every step of the way, I think it would be good to have the conceptual plan that that reroute is based on sort of as a little square in the corner, like, for instance, an Emony. Here's the <coughs> conceptual diagram of what an Emony was going to be like, and here's the plan that we have for the Anemone trail. Mm. Okay. So that you can sure. see the connection between what led to that, di that yeah. trail alignment. Okay. Um, I, there's something else that I've been mulling about that I really don't want to get in depth talking about tonight. But for, for virtually, for almost every single trail, I could see that connection from what, what had the public had agreed to on a conceptual alignment to the next one. There was just one case where it wasn't, and I'm trying to figure out what might be appropriate when it, the, tra the final trail alignment doesn't really fall from the previous decisions, and mm. in the next month or two I may think of something that's appropriate to talk about. <laughs> okay. I would so, welcome that. But I thought it was very well done, and I agree with Andrea. The number of staff and the accessibility of finding answers was really an important part of it. Okay. Good. So please thank all the staff who gave up their evening. I will thank them again. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to follow up the point Karen was just making and didn't don't mean to preempt a perhaps a broader discussion that would occur in the future. But I I agree that there needs to be some mechanism by which certain trails are at least brought to the board's attention where what's being proposed on the ground, but hasn't been done yet, um, may differ sufficiently from the conceptual that you realize, you know, boy, we really ought to at least run this by the board if the board doesn't, you know, says, no, that's fine, or, you know, but at least give us a chance and the public a chance to sort of weigh in on that. I, I don't have a sp sort of a specific, you know, metric on, well, what would fit that, but I would encourage staff to, you know, uh, a little bit of just judgment about, all right, and I, I think you know which trail uh, Karen's probably talking about, but, you know, how much is what we're doing really the same as what's on the conceptual map, or how does it, you know, perhaps deviate pretty substantially, and, but also err a bit on the side of having a little process around it. If you're not sure, it doesn't cost much to send us an informational yeah. update, by the way, here's the conceptual, here's what we're actually planning to do, and let people indicate whether they think the issue warrants a more focused discussion or, no, that's fine. Um, I think there's a fairly low threshold to just giving us a heads up. We've taken a look at this, and we think to actually get this done, we're gonna have to go pretty far south and then back to the north, and that may raise some questions in some people's mind that, you know, Okay. warrants a further discussion. So <clears throat> I'd say there are ways of flagging that ahead of time before it's a done deal on the ground and in a way that's pretty low in cost in terms of process mm -hmm. and then see whether it, you know, catches someone's eye as warranting a more in-depth discussion. Okay. You know, those Thank guys, it could just be an information update. So yep. yep. You know, okay. See what reaction they get. Okay. I mean, I'm at a great disadvantage because I was visiting family, so I missed the snacks as well as the <laughs> meeting. Um, so I can only guess at what was what was there, and, and based on what people have told me, and I, I really think an annual thing is a great idea here, and make it a big fanfare. Here's what we're doing this year, and the the other things I'd say to be critical about to, to put into that is number one. Here's how many volunteer hours we think we're gonna need. Yeah. Here's where you sign up. And then here's how much this is we, we spent last year. We did X amount of miles or whatever. If you wanna see more, like this is a budget thing, vote for that. 
so vote for taxes to do more or something. So you're marketing the fact that like, in the time that I've been here, one of the things I've heard is so consistently budget constraint. And you don't have to be constrained by budget unless the public does it, w does, wants you to be constrained by budget. And I think that if you said we wanna pass an X percent tax to rebuild and maintain the trails, you'd have better luck than with a lot of other things. So especially if you're marketing it as, this is what we can do this year, this is all we can do this year, but there's a tax that's gonna be on the ballot. Um, something like that might be a huge help in terms of helping people understand why things are progressing at the rate they are. Okay. And um, one more thing is I wonder if you can take some of your poster boards and um, foam core them if they're not already and, and make it a road show at a trailhead. <laughs> and do that two- at a, at a trailhead? Yeah, and do that two or three weeks before the project associated mm. with that is gonna happen. You know, as a way to drum up volunteers and also increase awareness. Okay, we're kicking off construction and mm -hmm. this is what it's gonna look like and this is why we're doing it. But take it to the people a little at more. At the trail site. Yeah. At the trail site. At the yeah. trailhead. At the trail okay. site. Okay. Well, unless the trail site's either doesn't exist yet or is so far away. <laughs> so far away. So yeah. far away that no one sees it. And see one's there, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's just someone in the woods where there's going to be a trail just <laughs> a sign. Not a lot of people are gonna come by. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I would like to just let you know that uh, one of those projects is, is uh, done. Uh, the bridge on White Rocks, uh, East Boulder White Rocks Trail cool. has been completed and back in place. Um, so that one's opened um, about a week now, so. Great. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next up, hold on, Luke, just one more thing. We just wanted to have an update from Casey just on the Eldo Walker to, uh, Eldo to Walker uh, multi-use connection, just given that the last time we visited on that was back in February and you all had a motion. Since then, um, there's a couple things we wanted to update you. Uh, most recently, county commissioners had a conversation, so Casey will just get you up to speed a little bit here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, just for the record, Casey French Planner with uh, Open Space Mountain Parks. Um, so on March 1st, CPW um, wrote a letter to uh, us and Boulder County Parks and Open Space staff, and they recommended that any decisions regarding the multi-use uh, trail connection uh, be put on hold until an El Dorado Canyon State Park visitor use management plan uh, could be <coughs> developed. Um, so the on hold request is consistent with the board motion to defer a final decision until after the capacity capacity issues and tra um, such as traffic congestion um, and uh, amongst other things are addressed. Um, the difference between the CPW uh, letter and request and the previous anticipated uh, next stage is that uh, CPW through the visitor use management plan um, will further consider and explore um, allowing mountain biking along the north uh, route as well as exploring an alternative that does not make the connection. Um, and these alternatives will be considered um, along with all potential future uses of the state park. Um, so the CPW will kick off the visitor use management uh, process this summer, and uh, there will be involvement and collaboration from all of the agencies and the stakeholders. Um, there will be representatives from us, Boulder County, Boulder County Transportation um, involved on that. Um, so in consideration also of CPW's um, announcement, it's now envisioned that any kind of future design um, or refinement of the north route uh, would not concur um, simultaneously, but would occur subsequently subsequently um, to the visitor use uh, management plan. Um, there may be some preliminary work, such as looking at you know, current conditions along the existing El Dorado Canyon State Park, um, or El Dorado Canyon Trail, I'm sorry. Um, that, may, that would be beneficial to us regardless of you know, which option was chosen, and also kind of scoping out the next phase. Um, so it's I, the idea is that this foundational work would allow us to jump right into the uh, trail design or refinements um, and, and analysis analysis um, if a north route you know was recommended through the visitor use management plan um, so also concurrent to the visitor use management plan Boulder County transportation uh, will pursue transportation management strategies um, this also does include um, improvements to the private portion of the El Dorado Springs Road uh, looking at bike shoulders on State Highway 170 looking at the shuttle um, we're very mindful of the need to coordinate all these um, various efforts and we'll focus uh, careful attention on dovetailing these efforts, and uh, we'll be looking at kind of a formal, out, a formal agreement outlining roles, responsibilities, and scopes, and whatnot. 
Um, circling back around, as Steve mentioned, um, the other events that have occurred since your February meeting um, was at the Boulder County Commissioners, they held a public meeting instead of a public hearing. Um, and this change was to provide consistency as it relates to the timing as when governing bodies are providing a final recommendation. So, you know, any final uh, recommendation that would come from the county would be, at, you know, concurrent, at, you know, any final recommendation that may come from, from the city. But the meeting did provide an opportunity for them to provide their thoughts and their guidance. Um, in the most general terms, they agreed with the next steps presented to them regarding developing a comprehensive proposal. Uh, they provided guidance that supported further and thorough consideration of the north route um, along with the no action alternative. Um, and they provided guidance that uh, Boulder County should continue collaboration, especially leading the transportation elements, considering that's in their wheelhouse. Um, so there is a link to the video of the commissioner's meeting, which is posted on the project website um, if you're interested. We also did provide a written update uh, to, to city council on the previous process and next steps, um, and it's envisioned that after the visitor use management plan, um, and if their consideration of the north route is recommended, um, then a comprehensive partner agency recommendation package would be brought back to you um, and the other bodies for, for consideration. So I know, I know that might have been a lot and I was trying to get through it quickly, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions or. Well, um, I know it's, you know, we have, limited ability, I suspect, you know, on how CPW decides to run its own process. But, you know, there is an important difference between a concurrent process and a sequential process in at least one respect, which is if you, is the initial uh, visitor use plan going to take into account at least a scenario <coughs> in which the trail exists? If what ends up happening is, uh, the plan is produced and it doesn't make any assumption one way or the other. And then you say, well, okay, now let's talk about how in the world envisioned by this use plan the trail would work. The answer might be, well, actually, we need to go back to the use plan and factor in, well, what would mountain bike use look like? And, you know, it may not be terribly difficult to take that into account as they go along, but if, there's nothing in the use plan about at least the scenario that we're trying to address, then they have sort of lost a significant opportunity here. And it was part of why our motion said that, you know, taking these issues up, we didn't use the word concurrently, but it was the spirit of it, will bring additional resources into the discussion. And so, you know, it's a way of sort of saying the plan, I, it seems to me, has to, at least in one alternative, say, well, what would we do if there was significant mountain bike traffic? It doesn't have to prejudge the outcome of the Eldota Walker connection process. But I think it has to at least consider that, well, there's, <laughs> there's multiple possible outcomes, one of which is that there are some mountain bikers that you have to take account of. So uh, I have we been sent the, the March 1st letter? Um, I don't know whether it's been available to all board members. I can I can uh, make sure it is. I can forward that for sure. That would be a good step. Yes. So it's my under, just understanding, Tom, that they will visit the decision and evaluate through this process whether CPW supports a north route or a no action and design around that in concurrent with all the visitor use management plans, kind of the future. Um, the future use and the and the future and so I don't want to get too far into it because we do need to go back and rescope as multi agencies and us to learn a little bit more about it. But it's my understanding that they will they will look at the scenarios, make a you know make a decision on which one they prefer, um, and design around that. Oh, okay. I, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. I think it would be interesting to read the March first letter with Tom's question in mind. I yeah, because the, the, Cause the March 1st letter had a more of a feel of the mountain bike issues are just being put on hold and, you know, aren't going to be discussed until after the use plan is done, which is why I thought the, yeah. the sequential approach really wasn't going to do any work on that. But you're saying now it's a little more integrated well, than 
the way I had interpreted we, Mark's we letter. We won't do any further work yeah. on the North until we hear back, you know, whether or not, you know, the, the one sentence says the plan would consider all uses of the park, including the proposed Elder Walker Trail and possible future conditions and trends. I'll, you know, I can send, I can send the letter, um, but yeah, there is a little bit of that scoping about what's done, you know, concurrently. We don't want to get ahead of, you know, a decision, um, and then what is, what is, what is really subsequent, so be working, um, you know, together with all the agencies to kind of, you know, well, the, well there's a part that's squarely CPW process, but then the different parts on how they dovetail, we'll, we'll work on together. Okay, anything? Okay, okay. thanks. Is, thanks, Casey. Uh, as Luke comes down, let me just, a couple other updates, just if you look to the southwest today, you probably would have seen a column yeah, of smoke, good. which, yeah, meant we actually had a very successful prescribed burn. We um, had 18 acres that were burned through the effort of our staff, Boulder Fire, and a lot of other firefighter cooperators. Um, and in fact, they accomplished enough that they will not have to burn tomorrow. So there was kind of a potential that they may have to continue. Um, and they felt the quality of the burn was, was really quite exceptional, I think kind of our nice little bit of warm spring day really helped us out there. With so, no wind. With, yeah, or very light wind, yes, exactly. Um, there also, though, may be some additional burning that happens early next week, so we'll continue to share information out to the community as we find those conditions right for us to continue to make progress in that, in that area. And this is a continuation of the burning in the um, Shanahan area that we've been progressively working on over the last couple of years. And it was a awesome joint venture. I, when I came out of my place, I saw the Four Mile, Sugarloaf, Left Hand, U.S. Forest Service, and Sheriff's Office fire trucks all going by in a parade. So, and I, and I know there were volunteers up there directing pedestrians away from the area, so I, kudos for all the people that coordinated all that effort. It's nice when we can get a natural process helping us out a little bit and nice natural conditions favoring that too. So that's a great accomplishment for the day. Um, in addition, just speaking of great accomplishments, just recognition that Dave Sutherland and Juanita Echeverry um, were recognized by the Boulding, Boulder Housing Partners for a partnership award, given the work that they've done collaborating with Boulder right. um, Housing and working with um, some special education programs. And so just, again, just another great kind of call out that we kind of exemplify in various ways, you know, some partnership efforts working with um, peer agencies, but also with the community. So then lastly, um, just a um, reminder that the Front Range Eco or, uh, Research Symposium for the April 19th Symposium, that's in our horizon, but if you haven't RSVP'd and you want to, the deadline is before Monday, so before April 1st. So I know we've sent that information out, but if it would help us, we can always get that back out if you are interested and make sure you can RSV RSVP for that symposium. Realized there was an RSVP. So there, there is. We'll they, send it again. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll make sure that gets sent out. Okay, and then with that, I think done with the director's updates. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, good evening. My name is Luke McKay. I'm a property agent with Open Space and Mountain Parks, and I'm here tonight to request that the board approve a motion to approve and recommend that City Council approve. The conveyance of approximately one half acre of the 70 acre St. Walburga Abbey open space and the vacation of access easements on 6417 South Boulder Road, together with the acquisition of approximately one half acre of land, the conveyance of an amended and restated conservation easement on approximately 21 and a half acres, and the granting of an access easement over 6417 mm -hmm. South Boulder Road, which in the memo and throughout the presentation I collectively refer to as the land trade. So before diving into the details of the land trade and why staff is recommending it tonight, uh, we wanted to provide some background on the history of these properties and how we got to where we are today. So in 1996, the city acquired the 70-acre St. Walburga Abbey open space and the approximately 20-acre St. Walburga Lou conservation easement together with the joint use access easement, which is depicted in orange on the map in front of you. Three years later in 1999, the city acquired what staff refers to as the city access easement, depicted in brown, which extended the city's access over and through 6417 South Boulder Road, including the portion of the property encumbered with the conservation easement to the St. Walburga Abbey open space. And Excuse from here- me, can I, is there any way that you can point on the map over there what you're talking about? Yep. It doesn't work on both 
Oh, it doesn't work on that one. Okay, so. Just, just maybe standing up and pointing to that one, Eva. So the joint use access easement is this orange, uh, fixed in orange right here, and then the city access easement, or what we refer to the city access easement, is depicted in brown. Okay, thank you. I believe these same maps are in the memo. Yeah, well. it's just that I. Yeah. And so um, instead of saying 6417 South Boulder Road, again and again, uh, from here on out, I'm gonna refer to it as the Zen Center property. So in 2015, a tenant of the Zen Center property encroached on the St. Walburga Abbey open space by depositing large piles of mulch north of the driveway that provides access to both the open space and the Zen Center property. While investigating that encroachment, OSMP learned that the legal description of the joint use access easement did not correspond with the location of the driveway and the constructed access, and that the tenant had deposited mul the mulch on the joint use access easement. And after refusing to remove the mulch, the tenant was cited and charged by OSMP rangers for damaging public property. Oops. In 2016, the tenant pled guilty to that charge in Boulder Municipal Court, and under the court agreement, the city agreed to correct the joint use access easement in order to overlay the driveway and the constructed access. Last year, while we were working to correct the joint use access easement, the owner of the Zen Center property went under contract to sell the property to Chung Tai Chan Monastery USA, a religious not-for-profit organization. The monastery intends to redevelop the property with a 25,000 square foot Buddhist meditation and monastic training educational Zen Center, which the Boulder County Commissioners conditionally approved last or in January. One of those conditions is that prior to issuing any permits for the Zen Center, the legal access over the open space to the Zen Center must correspond with the driveway and the constructed access. Furthermore, the county is requiring the monastery to reconstruct the driveway and the access in order to meet their multimodal transportation standards and support the estimated 106 vehicle trips on weekdays and 290 vehicle trips on Sundays to the Zen Center. Whereas the existing driveway and constructed access over the St. Walburga Abbey open space ranges from 12 to 18 feet wide, is partially paved, and is used to access, <coughs> excuse me, a single family residence and agricultural operations, the county is requiring at a minimum an 18 foot wide paved driveway with an adjacent pedestrian path and side ditch for drainage, all of which is permissible under the joint use access easement. In order for the legal access over the open space to the Zen Center to correspond with the required reconstructed access, the city and the monastery have three options. Option one is to correct the joint use access easement by moving it to overlay with the driveway and the county's requirements for the reconstructed access. However, staff is concerned that both the increased frequency and the use of the joint use access easements and the improvements required to support that use will further impact the open space's charter purposes and natural resources and continue to pose a stewardship and man management challenge to the department. Option two is for the monastery to develop and improve the joint use access easement as it is legally described. Doing so, however, would not only impact habitat for the Ute Ladies Tresses orchid, a federally threatened species, but also impact land that's currently undisturbed and require restoration of the existing driveway and constructed access. Which brings us to option three, the land trade and our recommended option. Under the land trade, the city would convey the approximately one half acre depicted in red on the map in front of you to the monastery and vacate the joint use access easement and the city access easement in exchange for one half acre and fee of the Zen Center property depicted in purple, an amended and restated conservation easement expanded to protect an additional 1.3 acres depicted in turquoise, the vacation of the monastery's interest in the joint use access easement and a new access easement to the city, which is depicted in brown. I hate to say this, but I don't see where the purple and the red and the brown are on that map. So the, the red right here, the flag portion of this property. It's just the diagonal reds. It's, yeah, it's the red uh, crosshatch. Okay, there. and that's land that would go to the monastery. Correct, that's land that's currently owned by the city. And then the purple, what we would be ah, up there. is up here. 
Okay, and that's taken out of the blue land, which is currently owned by? Which is currently owned by the monastery. Okay. But, covered, but encumbered with a open space conservation easement. And that's okay. why it's Okay, and the brown is where? And the brown will be a new access easement to the city over the land that we are trading and then basically overlaying where our previous access easement was. So our access would still be by the basically the same place it is now? Correct. It's a new agreement. A new agreement, and also a sl over um, the uh, the monastery is going to make some. I'll go back to an earlier slide. This this map here shows the the site plan for the the Zen Center, and there's uh, nothing there now, right? There's a right now it's a, a single family home um, and some agricultural structures. I think I believe it's a mobile home. And so the, the new access easement will correspond with the, the road system that's depicted on that site plan. Okay, and the you ladies' tresses that you talked about, that habitat is where? That habitat is north of the red area, but south of the ditch. And the ditch is depicted Also okay, and when, when I was out there, there was a tremendous population of teasel. Right. And my perception was that it was largely along the ditch. Yeah, so there, there is a lot of um, teasel along this section of uh, McGinn Ditch. Um, this is the area also where the tenant of the previous owner deposited large pi piles of mulch and city staff a couple years ago had to go out there and restore the area. That restoration to date hasn't been successful. So I should clarify when I say you ladies trust this habitat, it's historic habitat. They were there in the past. Our hope is that they will be there in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so dense. No, it's a, it's a complicated <laughs> transaction. So since the, since the land trade requires a disposal, <coughs> or requires a disposal, OSMP assessed the option through the lens of whether it would enhance open space charter purpose, purposes and better enable staff to protect and steward those purposes, providing an overall net benefit to the city's open space system uh, and program. And in our opinion, uh, the land trade does just that. The land the city is trading to the monastery is primarily used and improved for access, and the open space charter purposes this land supports and protects are nominal. On the other hand, the one half acre the city is receiving is in active agricultural production, is identified in the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan as significant agricultural land, and includes riparian habitat buffering New Dry Creek Carrier Ditch. Moreover, city ownership of this land will allow OSMP to bring it under the same resource management regime as the St. Walburga Abbey open space and widen the connector between the open spaces western and eastern parcels. Mm -hmm. Amending and restating the St. Walburga Lou conservation easement will better protect open space charter purposes and the Zen Center property's natural resources by upgrading the easement language to today's standards and placing additional restrictions on the property. The most significant of these additional restrictions is tying the monastery's water rights, uh, which includes a one-half share of McGinn Ditch, to the conservation easement property, which will ensure that the monastery or a future owner cannot sell their water off of the property, thereby drying up the land and the resources that we're trying to protect under the easement. Furthermore, in addition to amending and restating the conservation easement, the easement will protect approximately 1.3 additional acres, including wetlands and areas of high biodiversity for a total of 21.5 acres. And that additional 1.3 acres, again, it's hard to see, but it is it's right there. this area here outlined in purple. And that's added to the blue conservation easement? Correct. 
And lastly, the monastery will convey a new access easement to the city, allowing the city to maintain legal access to the St. Walburga Abbey open space without the responsibility for or cost of maintenance. So in conclusion, it's for those reasons and staff's analysis of the alternatives and determination that the land trade will also satisfy the municipal court agreement that OSP recommends that the board approve the motion in front of you. And with that, I can take any questions that you may have. I just have one other question. Yep, no problem. Um, the 1.3 acres, tell me functionally how that serves the people who are going to be working the conservation easement land. I mean, I understand about the 0.5 acres and how that helps functionally. Right, so. But talk about the functionality of the blue slice. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 I guess the charter purposes or the, the resources that staff is trying to protect and adding it to the conservation easement are, um, Primarily, it um, includes wet meadow habitat and also some um, and a historic wetlands that were also damaged by kind of the previous land mm -hmm. uh, management regime of um, uh, mulching. And, and so those mulch piles have since been removed and the, the monastery is currently restoring those areas basically um, by removing that disturbance allowing um, uh, the wetland vegetation that was there to reestablish uh, given the, um, um, the soil seed bank that's, that's remained. Um, this portion of the property is fairly, given its proximity to, to the ditch, uh, is quite a bit different than the rest of the CE property. The rest of the CE property is primarily <coughs> agricultural yeah. uh, and most recently has been used for um, haying and grazing of um, uh, llamas. So it's just for the conservation purposes, not necessarily to connect their ag land in terms of the conservation easement property. Uh, yeah, it, the, the real driver behind adding uh, this additional 1.3 acres is just to um, basically protect what we saw as like the, um, the most critical kind of conservation values or open space purposes that weren't protected by the original conservation okay. easement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, this is set for a public hearing. Um, and so if anyone from the public wishes to speak to this disposal, this would be the time to do that and seeing no interest from the public, we'll close the public hearing and return to the board. Um, is there any discussion or do people want to go to a motion? Or I'm ready sure. to go to a motion, but I don't want to read that thing. It's long. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we paid you extra tonight with lots of sugar. <laughs> Fine, I, I will. I'll, I'll say I move that and then I'll read it the one time once we're, once we're done uh, uh, when we need to read it into record because I'm not going to read that whole thing to say I'll move this. Okay. I'll second it. Any, any discussion? Okay. I'll, I will read the whole thing then. <laughs> uh, I move that the Open Space Board of Trustees approve a motion to approve and recommend that City Council approve the conveyance of approximately 0 0.5 acres of the approximately 70 acre St. Walburga Abbey Open Space, Boulder County Parcel Number 15770200104 to Chung Tai Chen Monastery USA, but reserving <laughs> any a pertinent mineral rights and the vacation of a joint use access easement and access easement on 6417 South Boulder Road pursuant to the disposal procedures of Article 
uh, 12, Section 177 of Boulder City Charter, together with the acquisition of approximately 0 0.5 acres of land, the conveyance of an amended and restated conservation easement on approximately 21.5 acres and the granting of an access easement over 6417 South Boulder Road from Chung Tai Chan Monastery, USA for open space and mountains parks purposes. <laughs> well read. All right, so uh, then all in, since that's been seconded and all in favor of that motion, all right. Great work. Yeah. Great, thank you. Awesome. And apologies for the maps. We'll make those yeah. clearer for council. It's a complicated <laughs> it's a arrangement. It is, it is yeah. yeah. Very complicated. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. So I think that then takes us to matters from the board, uh, the first of which is a process committee update. I think we can keep this <laughs> very short. I think Darren's essentially covered it. But we did meet on February 27th. Um, uh, Cindy Carlisle was there representing the city council. Um, Kurt and I were there, as was uh, Karen. And the, the focus of that was essentially on the survey, and I won't go over the various comments that were made since they've been mooted by the fact that the survey's now gone out, but that's, that is what we did, was discuss in some detail the, uh, uh, the content of the survey. Um, the next process committee meeting is April 2nd at 11.30, not 12. Um, at the OSMP hub. Um, I know uh, Karen and I, uh, Kurt cannot make it, and Karen uh, and I will be uh, representing us at that. Um, <coughs> so we're you know, obviously still awaiting the survey results, which won't be in um, at the time of the April 12th process committee meeting, and so we'll instead be focusing on, as we discussed, the next step, which is moving into the um, financial sustainability and prioritization set of substantive issues. Right. If there's anything you, you know, would like to convey that we bring to that, um, this is certainly the time to do so, but... Um, perhaps, I wouldn't, uh, okay. I mean, it's just a, uh, you know, if you have a suggestion. No, <laughs> it's just, it's a, you know, it's a process discussion. We're not discussing the substance of the financial sustainability uh, scenarios or how to prioritize things. That's all going to be, um, you know, part of our April 17th study session where we'll be going over that in uh, great detail. Yep. This is really just uh, more at a process level, sort of define, you know, what the path looks like, but not the, not the substance of it. And Tom, just to clarify. I also should say that meeting is right before the Prairie Dog Tour. Right. Uh, that whether, you know, just so people should be, for those whom that affects, it's a, a pretty long sequence of open space events. And I, I may have misheard you, but I thought you might have said April 12th. It's April 2nd. Oh, did I say 12th? It's definitely April 2nd. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry if I misspoke. And do we know yet? how the two field trips are lining up in terms of numbers? It seems like just uh, what we have right now is probably the 17th is the more populated tour. The second seems to be the less, um, people are not preferring the second. We've got a couple people. And I'll just say, I, I recommend it to Dave that he go on the 17th when he's actually will have been sworn in as a member of the board. But on the 2nd, he'd be a member of the public, not just any member of the public, but technically won't have been sworn in yet. And I think he, I don't know if he followed that advice, but that was my suggestion to him. Yeah, I think I, well, okay. <laughs> and what about distribution of council members on the two trips? Do you know? I believe most council are so far that we've heard from are on the 17th. I just keep in but mind the 17th is the same night as our study session. Right. So it's a, either way, if you're at the process committee, either way, the second or the 17th is a long, long, a long day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got a lot to fit in and kind of short windows here. So yeah. appreciate your understanding around that. We got broken in in March. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So. Um, unless there's something else on that, for upcoming public meetings that we, I, 
My suspicion is we ought to just notice both of the prairie dog tours. Council will want that anyhow, and it also gives people the flexibility at the last minute if they decide to switch to the other one, they can do so. Um, so we're good on designating those. Yep. Um, the April 19th Front Range Open Space Research Symposium, we, we don't need to notice that because it's not an event hosted by the city, in essence. Okay. All right, so we don't. I'm not aware of any other meetings between now and um, our next board meeting or even a week thereafter that are gonna command attendance that needs to be noticed, but do you? It's the, uh, I think the, there's an irrigation ditch open house that if there were more than two board members that were interested in participating on that, that'd be April 15th. That would just help us know in advance because it'd be a tight time frame to notice it on the 10th or to have you call it out on the 10th. Um, I think that's the, and I guess the other one is the What's Up Boulder too. So there's the general city event that has kind of a broad array of different departments sharing events that are happening, projects are working on, and kind of a collective opportunity for community members to uh, weigh in or, and or at least understand different projects. And so that was also something if there's um, more than two board members would like to attend that, we would need to notice, make sure that gets noticed. So um, we should. I'm not going to give them. Okay. Yeah, I plan to attend. We, um, the What's Up Boulder. Okay. Uh, well, since Kurt may, he's not present, but he may want to attend, why don't, that gives us already two, why don't we notice that one just in case that attracts a third? Um, the ditch, is anyone? I'm not. No, okay. So I don't, doesn't sound like you need to notice, notice that one. the Great. irrigation ditch meeting. The Thank you. The okay. only other one that I have on my calendar is the um, Saturday, April 13th, prescribed burn field trip that's a multi-agency thing and I don't know where that falls in the rules and regs. It, probably similar to the research symposium because it's not strictly a city meet, meeting or hosted meeting for conducting city business. Okay. So that takes care of upcoming public meetings. I wanted to just mention that there was the tribal consultation last week. Um, uh, Dan and Phil Yates were there from the, from the department for the entirety of it. The city was very well represented from the mayor and the city attorney's office and a great many other people. Um, I was and there. And the archeologist, what's his name? Chris Driver. Oh, Chris, I'm Chris. sorry. Um, and I was there for much of it. Karen was there for a good portion of it. Nearly all of it was behind closed doors and not, you know, we were not to speak publicly of what was discussed. Um, there was a, you know, a formal sort of press release announcing that a, the formation of a working group um, ultimately leading to uh, a meeting that would be a year from now to continue the consultation. Um, I would just say at a, at a very general level, not revealing what was sort of said behind closed doors, it was, you know, I thought it was a fascinating meeting. I thought I, you know, I, I personally felt I learned a great deal. I think the city and certainly the department needs to be careful about resources here. That I think the opening one, having two days and having that level of senior representation probably made sense. And I think we do need to be attentive to the amount of time this takes, and then I think you would naturally do that anyhow. Um, I think Dan, well, just be, you know, it, be, be sensitive to the fact that this, you know, particularly if it's gonna, the working group could be a major time commitment and be sensitive to your own resources and how best to, uh, how best to get that staffed. Um, the meeting did not bop along at a quick pace. I think, <laughs> I think that's a good point. And I have heard some discussions since then among people outside of the meeting talking about the cost of the meeting itself and whether it would be wise to do it every other year instead of every year. Um, and I don't know if you know, Steve, where the money came from to fund that meeting. Was it OSMP budget or did it come from another part of city budget? Do you know? I think there was some sharing of costs in that, but that's something I know probably. It was said at the meeting that it, I think at least a large portion of it came from open space that we were perceived as 
you know, obviously there was no board discussion of that ahead of time, but that was the representation was that we were sort of hosting the meeting. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a question that we ought to be looking at. I'd be more than happy to sh share this with Dan, and I know Dan not being here, he was probably gonna be also just sharing some of his thoughts at the April meeting too, because he was certainly wanting to, to pass along some of that. I think I can also just say, knowing that we haven't had a consultation or we haven't revisited these MO MOUs in a long time, that it probably was a bit of a heavier involvement lift just to reestablish and kind of get some okay. foundation going. And I really hear your point, and I think that's something to be mindful, but also know, I think as we get it back into a, f a certain frequency, whatever that right frequency is, we can talk about, but it'll be a, a less involved or a less intensive effort as it becomes <laughs> more of a continued engagement with each other. And I didn't mean to imply any sort of uh, criticism of that, because in fact, I think just the opposite. I think it conveyed a powerful message to have the city manager, the city attorney, the mayor, other members of city council, the head of the department, you know, uh, representatives from the board of trustees, as well as a num number of other senior officials from around the city. I think that conveyed the desired message and conveyed a level of sincerity and, um, mm -hmm that, you know, in seriousness, that was helpful, but uh, we need to be careful going forward on um, the level of resources this could, you know, could consume. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah. Um, and I, did oh, you already mention the the renaming? Well, I was gonna, I, no, I was just going to, I wanted to sort of publicly raise the question of, this is initially just at a sort of a process level of, you know, what if any understanding you have of the city's plans for at a process level, sort of reviewing that um, and, you know, uh, what resources you would include in the discussion of whether to rename Wonderland Lake as a wildlife sanctuary. Oh, Wonderland Lake, sorry? Were oh. you referring to Settlers oh, Park? Oh, you're yeah. doing Settlers Park. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we've got a couple of <laughs> different naming oh, yeah. <laughs> questions. One, of the, okay, one of the big items on the agenda from the tribal consultation was the renaming of Settlers Park. Yep. So, so and and so that goes along yes. with Tom's question of renaming of things. Is there a general policy or procedure that? There is a, an overall city policy for commem commemorative, I'll say that right, commemorative nam naming, I can't get that out, um, that the, goes through the city manager and there's a process, which is what is being kind of the process for Settlers Park, and also currently the process for Wonderland Lake, although Jane has yet, and she'll provide some guidance to us, which hopefully we'll be able to report back um, in April about whether we'll continue to use that process or know that maybe in conversations since we're talking with the site plan in Wonderland Lake, if that's the right process, or if there's maybe a more suitable process specifically for Wonderland Lake. But for Settlers Park, we've been using that process, and that um, kind of got involved, or is now part of the tribal consultation. From that, um, the tribes now are considering the, and we'll be discussing their thoughts around that. Yeah perspective name change, and that will be one of the return items for the uh, consultation that'll happen next March. Okay, so it sounds like at, we'll discuss at the April meeting what... Um, Hopefully we'll have an update from Jane of how... Okay, it, it's not going to get renamed between now and then. It will not be renamed between now and then, that's okay. correct. It, no matter what, there will be a process, and that process will have some in, you know steps and opportunities for input around that. Okay. And certainly we'll keep you informed of how we can make sure you have an opportunity to. Okay. Any? I have just a quick question, and it's under the information items that were in the packet. Mm -hmm. um, whether the Open Space Board of Trustees has any role in the Rocky Mountain Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association Agreement? Is that going to be coming back to the board, or how, what's the process on that? I think this is mainly at this point just an, an informational update for you to know that that's been a process. It has gone through the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board only because they had not previously had designated sites that, that even though landings were occurring in the North Boulder Park, that, or the community park there, that they had never really formally designated a site, so they wanted to make sure they went through the uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Board to designate that. Since we have, through our plans, actually designated um, launching sites, that we've already kind of provided some, you know, approval, if you will, of kind of that 
aspect of the activity that takes off from the Wonderland Lake open space area. Mm -hmm. So I think it's mainly just an informational item to make sure you were informed. If you had questions about it, we're happy to try to answer those questions. But I don't perceive that it'll come back to you. So it sounds like if you have a specific concern about some language in the agreement, this would be the this is the time. This would be the time to raise those. Um, one of my questions is whether they have commercial use permits. It would. Let me, so I'll speak just that the organizi organization itself and through the MOU, they wouldn't, but individual um, commercial operators would have to have commercial use permits. The, the one reaction I had as I read through it was I think it's a great example of the kinds of collaborative use of parks properties and open space properties that we should be doing more of. Yeah, I think this was actually a nice example of Erica, Erica Pilcher, who was our staff lead on this, working with staff from Parks and Recreation, working with representatives from the Hank Glider Association, and actually, I think, really coming up with some very um, good working relationship that we will carry forward, too. And I think that's kind of something that's been just We've talked to the Hank Glider community, they've talked to them, and we've just never brought it all together, and that was really a focus here, is to make sure there was kind of an ongoing relationship, and the MOU only really f creates kind of a form formalization of that. I know in the past there have been concerns about jointed goat grass um, <coughs> areas up in that part of the system. Is this one of the areas? It is, yes. And it, so, so I think that's one of those kind of why it's key for us to work with um, particularly how they manage their equipment in the area and, and that's been kind of a long-standing issue and why it was so important for us to do education for them to be wary, aware of some of the risk and the issues and I guess I would also say just in the conversations I think they are very interested in trying to be good stewards of these sites and part of that is recognizing some of the potential Risks, risks, risks that come in with bringing in equipment and just using these sites and how they can use their resources. They've got very kind of a tight-knit group and mm -hmm. good communication lines and are probably even, they're much better at getting information out to the pilots than we would ever be and using yep. those channels can make us that much more effective. Okay. I, I guess I have a couple of parting thoughts. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna save like the, the big one, someday I'll write an editorial or something. But I had two based on tonight that are sort of like, I think indicative of the problems that I think you're gonna continue to have and that I'm glad I won't have to be a part of anymore. <laughs> um, the first one is I, I wish you were still here. I, um, whatever, it's been like the fourth time we've saw and seen uh, Andre Hausney here. Um, and he's an incredibly eloquent and well-educated and well-versed speaker. I think that the steps towards transparency have been amazing. Um, but I think that he's here speaking sp <coughs> says something about transparency is half of it, fairness is the other half. And trying to figure out what the right balance is in terms of how our agricultural lands are used for production, I think is the next big part. And you know, I have not, anywhere near the depth that you guys have of knowledge or him, but my knee-jerk reaction is that he's come in several times and said very educated things that make me think he really knows what he's doing and that he's struggling so hard to get ahead is really speaking to the fact that maybe the priorities should be looked at better. And transparency, this is, this is the value, the score you got's one thing, the assessment of what our community wants and how we score because based on that is another. And I think that should be part of a discussion that comes back to this board that I won't be on, um, for you guys to help and have a public process around that. Because I think that's, that's the literally, it's putting the $10 in each of the different buckets in real time. Because if you value something higher and that gets a higher score, that means that kind of ag's gonna happen. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say. And the second thing deals with prairie dogs. Um, I think that, like you've heard me talk before that I think we're heading towards this w doom and gloom where our prairie dogs are gonna be endangered. I think that's gonna happen. 
But I think there's another question that's really valuable here is that we're essentially living in a world of a novel ecosystem. Um, the prairie dogs' natural habitat as it was is gone. We've boxed them into small places and that means they can't have their normal behavior. We've removed their chief predator, um, the black-footed ferret. So they have a very different life cycle and life system than they used to. We're gonna need to find a way to have a sustainable population of prairie dogs that is viable into the future because there'll be a, a listed species at some point, but we can't have it be constantly about conflict. So I challenge you guys to come up with defining what Boulder County's novel ecosystem for prairie dogs should be. Not what it was, not what it is, but how, what would a thriving prairie dog ecosystem with human beings all around them look like? and try it and plan for that management so that in 50 years, when this is one of the last populations around, we're not dealing with this conflict all the time. We have a plan. And that's my last thing. Thanks. Well, then you'll have the last word. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>